tonight and tomorrow at the, um, uh, at the uh, workshop session, I hope to share some data with you and uh, show you where it leads. And the result is that this data ends up giving us a very young universe, um, a, a very young creation. I've been involved in this research for about 26 years now, and I've learned that God doesn't lie in his creation, and so the data that we get from the created order around us can be trusted. So what I want to do to tonight is to start with some basic physics. Now, don't let that scare you. Uh, my wife has been training me to talk in simple English, and uh, uh, she's still succeeding, and I have still a long way to go, but we'll just do, uh, do the best that we can. And tomorrow, in the three-hour session, there'll be other fields that I'll be talking about uh, in uh, astronomy and geology and so on with the young universe and the young Earth. So in this first session, I hope to be putting together some pieces of uh, a puzzle rather like a detective looking for clues. The clues indicate that at least five, there are at least five anomalies that can't be readily explained by current theories as they stand. Now, what do I mean by anomaly? Let's think that we've got some sort of theory to work and then some data comes in which disagrees with it. Um, this is totally discordant. Uh, what are you going to do? Throw out the data or throw out the theory? This is an anomaly. You've got theory and data not in agreement with each other. Well, for example, if you had a theory that all dogs were white and a black, black dog came along, what are you going to do? You're going to either accept the data that black dogs do exist, or are you going to change the theory uh, and change the theory, or are you going to throw the data away and say, no, whatever happens, my theory is correct, and all dogs are white? Well, that's the sort of uh, option that science has today. God didn't lie with his creation. And uh, so as a consequence, we can face the data that we get from the created order with some sort of courage, knowing that God can be trusted. So, okay, the clues that we're talking about indicate there are at least five anomalies which can't be readily explained by current theories as they stand. We'll discover that these five anomalies uh, current, uh, that currently accepted theories can't explain, currently accepted uh, ideas can't explain, lead, in fact, to a new cosmology. What do I mean by cosmology? Well, it's a study of the universe and what has happened and when and how and why. So as we have a look at these five anomalies, it turns out that we can develop a new cosmology, a new way of looking at the universe, a new way of looking at astronomy and geology and physics and so on. And we find that this inevitably leads to a young creation. In this session, we want to examine some of these anomalies and some of the controversy or controversy, as you like to say it over here. I come from a, a different country, as you've probably gathered by my speech. I feel a bit like uh, Peter there at the fire warming himself just before the crucifixion. And the, the maid says to him, your speech betrayeth thee. So, <laughs> okay. So as we have a look at all of these five anomalies, it turns out that there is one basic cause any one in itself would indicate that our theory is faulty, but we actually have five, or at least five, to deal with. The five anomalies together give us prima facie evidence that science has missed some key item in their understanding of the cosmos. And when this item is factored into their thinking, a new cosmology develops, which gives us a young universe. This cosmology is a reassessment of astronomical and geological evidence and the time scales used, and it's going to be discussed in the workshop sessions tomorrow. So for this first session, we need to familiarise ourselves with the five areas of current theory which are inadequate. We note to begin that the Hubble Space Telescope supplied a lot of new data and has overturned many ideas. As a consequence, Big Bang math, have, added, have had to add parameters, which they never expected to have to add, in order to get agreement between data and theory. In addition, some observations have shown that the further out we go, the more problems we have with the, with the math, with the Big Bang data. Now, because the math, uh, the, 
as they have it standing at the moment, fails to explain what we're actually seeing out there. So there's actually a different formula which uh, agrees with the data out there. And this is a, a warning sign that there is a theory in trouble here. So we need to reassess Big Bang modelling. Now, scientists are not liars. They try to look for the best fit for the evidence. And the evidence does e seem to indicate an expanding universe. But the Bible was way, way, way ahead of them. Because at least 12 times in the Bible, we're told that God created the heavens and then stretched them out. Well, let's look at the evidence that they found which led them to their theory of the universe. And we call it the Big Bang today, a Big Bang or a Big Expansion. And as it turns out, this evidence, or a lot of it, has been misinterpreted. And they've got themselves into a lot of bother as a result. The whole idea of the Big Bang started in the late 1920s with the discovery of the red shift of light from distant galaxies. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the, the red shift. Let me take a moment to explain. As you take light from, a, from the sun and put it through a prism, it breaks up into the seven rainbow colours that you're all familiar with. The rainbow does this automatically for us. The Lord has uh, worked that in, in a very beautiful way. Now, as you have a look at these, this colour spectrum, as we call it, you have a look at these, this, these colours in detail, you find that there are sets of dark lines on them. And these uh, dark lines come from various elements that we have in the sun. Each element has its own set, characteristic set of dark lines, rather like a barcode. Each element has its own barcode or spectral, uh, spectral lines, if you like. So that when we look at a star, a distant star, and we pass its light through a prism and we get this barcode, these spectral lines, we know exactly what elements are there in that star. So when we look at distant galaxies, we get spectral lines from all of the stars. And the important point is that the further out we look in space, the further down towards the red end of the spectrum, all these dark lines are shifted. And we call this the red shift. And here we have an illustration of what is happening. I think they've taken the line of calcium here. Here's the double line there. Here's our laboratory standard up here on Earth for these dark lines. Notice on this galaxy, the lines are shifted down this way a little more. It's further away. On this one, it shifted a little bit more because the galaxy is further away again. And on this one, look how far it shifted from the laboratory standard, which is way back here. This is a very, uh, very distant galaxy. And those spectral lines, those dark lines, are shifted down towards the red end of the spectrum, um, the, lower, the lower energy end, very, uh, very significantly. Now, the graph of redshift against distance is standard. It shows that the redshift increases with distance in a very precise way. Thanks, sweetheart. Here's the redshift distance graph. What we have here is the redshift coming up along here compared to distance along here. One indicates the origin of the cosmos. So see how the redshift is getting progressively greater and greater and greater, very significantly so, the closer that we get to the origin of the cosmos. Now, recent observations by the Hubble Space Telescope show that the graph was actually steeper than expected early on. It was coming up like this. Uh, what does the graph mean? Well, it means the further away a galaxy was, the greater is the red shift. Now, they needed to explain why the red shift was in existence. And what they did was to talk about the stretching of the universe. Astronomers thought initially that it was something like a Doppler effect. You're familiar with this as you uh, are on the highway there and a police car comes screaming up behind you with its siren going. The pitch drops as it passes you, and you sort of heave a sigh of relief. And uh, the pitch drops, and so you've got a longer wavelength coming to you as the police car is racing away. And astronomers thought, OK, the same thing is happening with light. These galaxies are actually racing away from us. And the light waves are therefore stretched, in the same way as the, uh, the, the pitch of the siren drops. 
and so the redshift values increased with distance. And so if the Doppler approach was followed, it implied that the cosmos was expanding faster at greater distances along here. Therefore, the cosmos expanded faster in the past and got slowed down by gravitational forces. You can understand that if the galaxies were initially racing away, and then you have gravity tending to slow this process happening. Well, Edwin Hubble of the Hubble Space Telescope fame uh, questioned this explanation of the redshift in 1929. He suggested it initially, but he also questioned it. He, he, um, you see, the problem was that the redshift are simply numbers, like 1, 3, or 2.547, something like that. They are simply numbers. But the redshift that you find over, over here, these are the numbers. These are the numbers. But what you found on that other diagram that we had with the, the spectral lines being shifted, you actually had a velocity there, talking about the rate at which these galaxies are moving away. And velocity is measured in kilometres per second or miles per hour or something like that. But the redshift is simply a number. One, two, 3.54, whatever. So there was a problem. Hubble was uh, not necessarily sure that uh, it was valid to put velocity values against such, uh, such numbers, um, but many others accepted the explanation. But there have always been some astronomers who have questioned the explanation, but the majority accepted it. Now, while most agreed that this was the interpretation of the redshift, that is, that the galaxies were racing away, another approach to the data was achieved with the same result. A new mathematical basis for the expanding universe was formulated by a gentleman called Lemaitre in 1931. It was an extension of Einstein's relativity. Einstein's approach was that you had a static cosmos in which the galaxies were racing away from each other, in which uh, the galaxies were moving through it. The universe was itself was not expanding, but the galaxies were moving. The problem was that some of these galaxies at the frontiers of the cosmos must have been moving pretty close to the speed of light. This meant that they, there'd be such forces operating on them that they'd disrupt. And uh, the, the Lemaitre approach was different. He said that the fabric of space-time itself was actually expanding. And uh, as a consequence, the redshift would follow because what would happen is that a light wave in transit through space, as space expanded, the light wave would get stretched and become longer and longer the longer it was actually travelling through space. And so this proposed that the light waves were stretched in, in transit as the fabric of space expanded. Therefore, you can get a redshift this way. Now, this approach is generally accepted by many scientists, but not all. The Doppler expansion uh, explanation has been promoted by the popular press, and some astronomers still hold to it. But the interesting thing is that the math and the equations are still basically the same, no matter which approach you have. So the problem has arisen with the new Hubble Space Telescope results because they only work if the expansion rate has actually increased with time, not decreased. This took them by surprise. Neither, neither approach predicted this result initially. This was an entirely new development which had to be factored into their equations. But either way, the redshift was the foundation on which the Big Bang was built. And the redshift equations, as I said, were the same in both cases. But a problem surfaced to both approaches in 1976. And it's been with us ever since. This problem threw an entire monkey wrench into the whole idea of this Big Bang. Both approaches predict that there would be a smooth change in redshift with distance. Something like a car with your, if you have your, your foot down on the accelerator at a steady level, the car smoothly accelerates with its speed increasing, increasing, increasing steadily until you reach a, a stable speed. Well, Another idea is that if you have an apple falling from a tall tree, the speed gradually builds up until the apple hits the ground. Well, as it turns out, 
The redshift doesn't do that. Instead, it appears to go in a series of jumps. It's quantized. You have quantities which are there in clumps. So what happens is something like, uh, if we go back to our car, the car, if you have your foot on the accelerator, would travel at five miles an hour, five miles an hour, five. suddenly it would jump to 10 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, 10, another jump, 15 miles an hour, 15 miles, another jump, 20. It doesn't happen like that out there with our car. It would be the same with the apple if that fell from the tree three miles an hour, seven miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, and it doesn't work like that. You can see the sort of problem that astronomers are getting themselves into. So this jump is what uh, this group, these groups of measurements, is called a quantization. Well, naturally, the finding was highly disputed. The more measurements uh, that uh, occurred, the trouble was the more it appeared. It all started with William Tift, a professional astronomer over in Arizona back in uh, 1976. And astronomers were aghast at this development because it threatened the whole base on which the Big Bang was, uh, was resting. They expected it would be easy enough to disprove the redshift quantizations simply by getting more measurements. Here they were saying, OK, we're not going to throw out our theory. We're going to question the data to start with. In 1981, an extensive redshift survey was published by Fisher and Tully. And the redshifts did not appear to be clumped, as uh, Tift had suggested they were. And the astronomers breathed a, breathed a sigh of relief and said, see, there we are, we, our problem is not really there, we just needed more data. And then it was discovered in 1984 that if you subtracted from that data the actual motion of the solar system through space, it turned out that all red shifts right across the whole sky were going in jumps. They were quantized. In 1985, well, of course, this, this was unacceptable. In 1985, two astronomers, Solentic and Arp, were not expecting to find any redshift quantization in their measurements. As it, instead, it turned up in their study of 260 galaxies. They were looking for something entirely different, and the redshift quantization turned out. In the mid-1990s, Guthrie and Napier set out to disprove it and ended supporting it with 399 galaxies. They had difficulty in getting some of their work published as a result of this. Now, here is uh, Guthrie and Napier's graph. Um, you have uh, distances out here, and along here you actually have, these are measured in velocities, uh, kilometres per second. And notice here you have systematic peaks where you have the red shift is at a, at a stable level. Then there's this trough here where the, there's uh, no change in the redshift, then another change there, another change there, and so on. So you can, and one astronomer pointed out uh, rather boldly and said uh, uh, rather courageously, one can see at a glance how accurately the troughs and peaks of redshift mark, march metronomically outwards from zero to over 2,000 kilometres per second. On the 5th and 7th of May in 2003, there were two abstracts in Astrophysical Journal by Morley Bell, who announced further evidence. The second abstract read in part, evidence was presented recently suggesting that galaxy clusters studied by the Hubble Key Project may contain, contain quantized intrinsic redshift components that are related to those reported by Tift. In other words, he's seeing the same thing as Tift saw. Here we report the results of a similar analysis using 55 spiral and 36 type 1a supernova galaxies. We find that even when more objects are included in the sample, there is still clear evidence that the same quantized intrinsic redshifts are present. Wow. The issue of the redshift quantization re refuses to go away, even though astronomers are still arguing. In fact, it's given astronomers a bad name. They throw out the data and they want to maintain their theories. The, uh, there's a, a story which goes something like this. Um, the, head astronomer, the head astronomer came in uh, from a university to the head mathematician in the university. And he said, uh, I've just made a marvellous mathematical discovery. I said the mathematician sceptically, what is it? I said the astronomer, 
it turns out that all odd numbers are prime. Oh, said the mathematician. Yes, said the astronomer. One's an odd number, it's prime. Three's an odd number, it's prime. Five's an odd number, it's prime. Seven's an odd number, and it's prime. Eleven's an odd number, and it's prime. Thirteen's an odd number, and it's prime. Just a minute, said the mathematician. What about nine? You can divide that by three. Oh, said the astronomer. That is just observational error. <laughs> okay. Well, this whole idea of the quantized redshift is fatal to both uh, current versions of universal expansion because it requires that expansion to go in jumps. There is other evidence that the red, uh, redshift quantization is not a speed or a velocity. As you have a look at the Virgo cluster of galaxies, for example, you find a redshift quantization right throughout the Virgo cluster except in the very centre. And there in the centre, the motions of galaxies are so high that it starts to wash out the quantization. So, okay, this means that motion is not giving you the red shift. It is rather washing out what you've already got. Even worse, they found that some redshift quantum changes cut right through the middle of some galaxies. What does this mean? Well, it means that if the redshift uh, is, uh, is a, uh, a motion or a, is a velocity, it means that your galaxies are going to be split in two and they should be disrupting. This isn't happening. Okay, well, if the redshift is not due to space expansion um, and it's not a velocity, the whole basis for the Big Bang is called into question. And all this places astronomers in a, in a dilemma. Do you want to uphold a model a theory, or really find out what's going on. This anomaly and the failure of the math at high uh, redshifts is a sign of a theory in trouble. Is there an alternative? Well, yes, there is. There's actually a very viable alternative, and we'll be discussing this in the, uh, uh, in the workshop sessions tomorrow. As it turns out, light emitted from atoms in galaxies will actually give you the same formula and the, uh, the, the problem that you have with the, the mathematical variation at uh, high redshift can be overcome rather readily. What it means is that atomic orbit energies were, gave rise to redder light back in the early days of our cosmos. In other words, the orbit energies were a little bit lower than what we have today. And there's a reason for that. And this reason comes down to the basic reason why we have these anomalies. So. This approach directly relates to the explanation for the other four anomalies in the young universe. So the problem with the redshift is one of the five anomalies that present theories can't account for, but they're all easily explained if one additional piece is added to the puzzle. Well, let's uh, list off the five anomalies. Five anomalies with one cause. We've already mentioned the quantization of the redshift. That's this one down the bottom here. Um, and uh, we've uh, already discussed, and I'll explain some of the others in, uh, in detail. Scientists have been examining the sizes and behavior of atoms and atomic particles, and they've assumed that they've always behaved in the same way that they're doing today. And these behavior patterns have been formulated in, in terms of constants, atomic constants, because they're describing or meant to describe atomic behavior. As it turns out, some of these atomic constants aren't constant at all. We have uh, decreasing values of the speed of light. We have increasing values of Planck's constant, and we'll talk about this in a minute. There's uh, increasing values of atomic masses and slowing atomic clock rates. These five anomalies are all children of the same parent. They all have one thing in common. The key is biblical. It gives a new cosmology, a young universe, a young earth, and it will be explained in the workshop. But for now, let's refocus our minds on these other four anomalies that present th uh, problems that theories can't account for. And we start with the speed of light. The speed of light we have uh, here as the shorthand, mathematical shorthand is the letter C. So if I lapse into mathematical shorthand and say that C has changed, you know that it's actually the speed of light that's changed. Okay, the declining speed of light was a major topic of discussion in the scientific journals from the mid-1800s 
until 1941. As an example, the astronomer Emmy J. Guri de Bray quote, was quoted in the journal Nature on the 4th of April 1931 as saying, and I quote, if the velocity of light is constant, how is it that invariably new determinations give values which are lower than the last one obtained? There are 22 coincidences in favour of a decrease of the velocity of light while there is not a single one against it. In the 350 years of the measured values of the speed of light, 16 different methods have been used and there have been 164 different determinations of its value. It is generally true, with some exceptions, that the measured speed kept decreasing, and this was the cause of the scientific comment. And it was true even when the same method were used or the same equipment was used by the same person many years later. In fact, we've got 17 examples of this. The later the measurement by the same equipment, the lower was the value of the speed of light. In 1886, Simon Newcomb, in the journal Nature, uh, published on uh, May the 13th, commented that the values of the speed of light obtained by the methods used around 1740 were consistent among themselves, but placed the value of the speed of light around 1% greater than what they were in the 1880s. In 1941, the physicist R.T. Burge, who kept track of all the values of these atomic constants, spoke of the speed of light values obtained by a variety of methods in the mid-1800s. Ironically, some of these methods were used by Newcomb. And Burge acknowledged in, his, in the journal Reports on Progress in Physics that, quote, these older results, including the ones that Newcomb got, these older results are entirely consistent among themselves, but their average is nearly 100 kilometres per second greater than that given by the eight more recent results. Here are astronomers and physicists who do not believe in a change in the speed of light, saying, well, the measured values, in fact, have dropped with time. About that time, the physicist N.E. Dorsey stated, as is well known to those who are acquainted with the several determinations of the velocity of light, the definitive values successively reported have, in general, decreased monotonously. So there was a Systematic trend downwards in the measured values of the speed of light that couldn't be denied. And there's a great deal of discussion about it in the scientific journals back in those days, and over 50 articles in one top journal alone. The discussion was all the more impressive because the speed of light was generally held to be a constant. The problem was that if the speed of light was changing, it was going to be potentially disruptive to the new physics that was developing. And it was more particularly the case in some atomic constants were also changing, whereas others were constant. The reasons why were unclear. Burge, who was the keeper of the constants, as I mentioned him earlier, he kept track of these variations right up until 1941, August of 1941. Then something strange happened. He wrote an article in Reports on Progress in Physics on the general physical constants, quote, with special reference to the speed of light. The introductory paragraph read in part, listen to this. This article is being written upon request and at this time, his emphasis, upon request. A belief in any significant variability of the constants of nature is fatal to the spirit of science as science is now understood. This closed the whole discussion. All the changing values of the atomic constants and the speed of light, okay, they're not changing at all. Ignore the data, we'll run with the theory. All the constants were declared constant and physics was not going to be sidetracked. Their theory was going to be intact. So the issue was now buried, but it was not dead. The trend in the atomic data continued. This way of doing things is not science. It's not, at least it's not good science. Science should look at the data. Why was Burge so upset back in 1941? Well, if C was high, if the speed of light was higher, it inevitably led to a chain of reasoning which showed that there was not enough time for evolution. And to tomorrow we'll show you that how this all works. But for now, they knew that evolution had to happen and so the speed of light 
had to be constant. I started investigating the changing atomic constants and especially the speed of light back in 1980. In early 1987, we had a, an invitation to write a major white paper on the atomic constants for internal review at Stanford Research Institute International, SRI International. Uh, it resulted in a 90-page report, The Atomic Constants, Light and Time, co-authored with Trevor Norman as, uh, and myself. All told, there were 638 measurements of 12 atomic quantities by 41 different methods published jointly by SRI International and Flinders University in August of 1987. <coughs> the data trend was compelling. The Professor of Statistics at Flinders University gave us 100% support and asked us to prepare a seminar on it because the whole math department was very, very excited with what we were doing. And um, around about December of that year, in December 87, V.S. Troitsky from Russia, uh, published in Astrophysics and Space Science, the evidence that there was a decline in the speed of light over the lifetime of the cosmos and associated atomic constants were also varying. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this was similar to what we had reported. And then someone contacted SRI International and Flinders University and said, are you aware of the fact that this research leads to a young universe and is against the theory of evolution. I was banned from the math department at Flinders University. My co-worker, Trevor Norman, eventually lost his job at Flinders University because of this. In 1993, a Canadian statistician, Alan Montgomery, and a US physicist, Lambert Dolphin, examined all the statistical criticisms which were coming in since 1987 and re-examined the data trends in the 87 report. They published a statistical analysis in a peer-reviewed journal which has never been refuted. What was the conclusion? The conclusion was that the, uh, the, the analysis gave full support to the data trends that we had outlined in our 87 report. Since then, <coughs> a variation in the speed of light has almost become a respectable idea among some astronomers and cosmologists. For example, Moffat in the 1990s, and Albrecht and Maguigio in 1999, John Barrow in 1999, and many other astronomers stated that many astronomical problems would be resolved if you had a very high value for the speed of light at the inception of the cosmos. Paul Davies followed this up in 2002 and there's been over 50 articles about this ever since. One problem. They have adopted what they call a minimalist approach. This means that they're varying the speed of light and only other things is, that are absolutely necessary. They are not conserving energy in the process. And here's where the problem comes in. If you're not conserving energy, in the equation E equals mc squared, m is constant, c is going sky high, so the energy from any given reaction must also be going sky high. The work that we had done in the report in 87, and I spent months on this trying to find out what was happening as some quantities were going up, others were going down, some went part way, I juggled my equations around. It turned out that this whole thing only worked if energy was being conserved in the process. So that as the speed of light went higher, atomic masses were lower. And so you actually had a position in which it wasn't a minimalist position, but it was a position in which energy was conserved and you find that all of your physical and chemical processes remain in balance. These guys are not doing that. And I had a, time, a chance to talk with Professor Ulbricht at, uh, at Davis a few years ago, <coughs> just after his uh, report came out. And I said to him, why are you dropping the speed of light dramatically shortly after the beginning of the cosmos? He said, well, we couldn't get the data to agree with other constants if we didn't do that. I said, it will work if you conserve energy in the process instead of adopting this minimalist position. He said, yes, he said, we looked at that, 
but he said, if we conserved energy, we could not achieve all we wanted to do with our theory. Okay, they're not running with the data, they're running with the theory. So, okay. So, with this work which we did in 1987, we'd not isolated the basic cause. What we had was a reason why things were behaving the way that they had, but uh, we only just would only have one part of the puzzle. And it turns out that when the basic cause is in place, all five anomalies are explained, and the speed of light is only just one effect, although a very important one, but it was not the primary cause of the five anomalies. So we come back to the actual fact that the speed of light has been measured as slowing. And in summary, we have this graph of the speed of light behavior from Burge. Yes, Burge, this is Burge's graph. This is how the speed of light behaved according to Burge, his best possible values. So, okay. So all the data is in the report, and that's available on our website. And the Montgomery Dolphin articles on statistics also demonstrate the, the uh, reality of this drop um, by the various methods. Okay, can we have the next slide, sweetheart? What we have here on this slide is another physical quantity called the Rydberg constant, in which all five or all four of these uh, five uh, quantities are actually varying in such a way that their variations cancel out. Look what happens to the result. Here, you have effectively a straight line, a constant value. You've got a couple of outliers here. You have a scatter around the average position. This is the sort of thing you should be expecting with the speed of light and all the other data that we've been questioning. It should be looking like this. But it doesn't. In fact, it comes down or it goes up or whatever. So the third anomaly, the third anomaly is uh, Planck's constant, H. Now, Planck's constant measures a special kind of radiation in the universe, and we'll talk more about that later, but it's been defined as a constant, but nevertheless, as you have a look at these values, they've been increasing with time. These are the officially recommended values for Planck's constant H. H is the mathematical shorthand. See how the recommended values have varied over time. These values were determined by a scientific committee which had examined all the measurements, and these are the best possible statistical value. The recommended value carries the weight of scientific authority. So the graph shows how this value has changed. Notice something here, because we'll pick this up a bit later. It, start, it seems to peak around about 1970, and then perhaps a change in direction. Keep that in mind. Okay. Now, the officially... Let's have the next graph, sweetheart. The officially recommended values of Planck's constant over the electronic charge is this one. Again, we've got Planck's constant. Look at the similarity of this graph to the one that we had for Planck's constant, although H over E, the Planck's constant over the electronic charge, is measured by an entirely different way of doing things. But nevertheless, you still have this increase which peaked around about 1970 and seems to be tapering off. Okay. The experimental values show that Planck's constant has been steadily increasing. One reviewer of the report that we issued back in 1987 had this to say. This, he said that the instrumental resolution may in part explain trends in the figures, but I admit that such an explanation does not appear to be quantitatively adequate. And in 1965, J.H. Sanders in the, physical, in the Fundamental Atomic Constants on page 13 pointed out quote, that the increasing values of Planck's constant can only partly be accounted for by improvements in re instrumental resolution and changes in accepted values of other constants. In other words, this increase in H in Planck's constant is anomalous. Current theory cannot account for this. The point is that Planck's constant has been measured as increasing with time. But... As it turns out, Planck's constant times the speed of light is an absolute constant. 
even astronomically. It means that the speed of light and Planck's constant are inversely related via this common cause. When one goes up, the other goes down. And it turns out there's an extremely good reason why. It turns out also that Planck's constant is a direct measure of this basic cause. The fourth anomaly is atomic rest masses and the behavior of atomic particles. Some atomic processes have been measured as changing, not just uh, Planck's constant and the speed of light. An important example is also directly related to the basic cause, and that's atomic masses, atomic uh, rest masses or electron rest masses. Not, we've got electron rest masses measured here, but it also applies to all other atomic particles. Um, Again, the graph shows atomic masses rising to 1970 and then flattening out just like Planck's constant did. And we need to know why they're doing this. And we'll discover there's a very viable reason why these quantities are varying in the way that they do. The fifth and final effect of the one basic cause is the rate of ticking of the atomic clock. Now, the atomic clock is based on the rate of movement of particles within the atom. Remember God said in Genesis 1.14 that the sun, moon and stars were given to us to be for signs, for seasons, for days and for years. In other words, the sun, moon and stars were to be our time measure. We had an orbital clock. The time takes the earth to go around the sun once. This is God's time measure. As it turns out with the math and everything which has been done with this work, this clock is ticking at a constant rate. It does not change with all the other changes that we've been talking about, even given the basic reason for these changes. Science, however, in the last part of the 20th century, took the atomic clock as its measure of time because they could get very, very small divisions of time. You get electrons whirring around atoms very, very fast. So you get small divisions of time. You can chop this thing up. And it has been assumed that uh, radioactive dates from the atomic clock are the same as orbital dates. They are assuming that the atomic clock is ticking at a constant rate. Well, a comparison between orbital time and atomic time was done from 1955 to 1981 and published by Dr. Thomas Van Flanden, of, uh, who was at the uh, US Naval, Ob Naval Observatory in Washington. He said, as the conclusion to his study, the number of atomic seconds in an orbital interval is becoming fewer. Presumably, if the result has any generality to it, this means that atomic phenomena are slowing down with respect to orbital phenomena. You getting the drift of this? The atomic clock is slowing with time. It means it was ticking faster in the past, so it means that your radioactive dates are systematically too old. Since then, many astronomical observatories around the world have noticed this discrepancy, and the slowdown up to 1970 again was picked up, and atomic clocks started to run faster than that. Now, thanks, sweetie. This is the graph of the rate of ticking of the atomic clock compared to our orbital dates. Look at this. The atomic clock is slowing, 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 again down to about 1970, and then it is starting to go up again. Something strange is happening here. This atomic clock rate follows the same pattern as the light speed curve. It bottomed out around 1970. The slowdown... Uh, to 1970 increased after that and radioactive clocks are similar and the decay rates because decay rates are governed by the same factors. We're getting close to the end here so hang in just a bit longer. The C measurements now can be used, uh, the, C, the way that C is measured now, the speed of light is measured now, is by using atomic clocks. But wait a minute, that atomic clock was slowing that atomic clock was slowing and the speed of light was slowing. If you're measuring a slowing speed of light with a slowing atomic clock, you're not going to notice any difference. <laughs> okay. 
it's like having defined your second as somewhat longer. And so your minute is going to be inevitably longer as well. So here's where we have a problem. One is moving lockstep with the other. So C, the C measurements that we obtain now can't detect changes in the speed of light because the atomic clocks are moving lockstep with them. Now, even Burge noticed this back in 1934. He was a very canny individual. He found that wavelengths of light didn't change when the speed of light did. And he concluded, if the value of the speed of light is actually changing with time, but the value of wavelength in terms of the standard meter shows no corresponding change, then it necessarily follows that the value of every atomic frequency must be changing. Atomic frequencies are the rate at which the atomic clock is moving or how fast atomic particles are moving within the atom. So all atomic clocks tick at a rate proportional to the speed of light. And the graph of uh, the speed of light behavior is basically the same as the rate of ticking of the atomic clock. And since atomic clocks, including radioactive clocks, ran faster in the past, radiometric ages are not orbital ages. The number of times the Earth has gone around the sun is not the same as the number of ticks on the atomic clock. The two things are measuring time in a different way. Their years are not the same. The atomic clock, the radiometric clock, give ages which are systematically too old. And in the workshop tomorrow, we'll be talking about the mathematical correction that we can apply to the atomic clock. And when we do that, it turns out that all of your radiometric ages, all of the immense astronomical and geological ages can be fitted into a framework in which we have in the scriptures. And the time problem is resolved. So in summary, five separate anomalies are involved, all behaving synchronously. They all have one basic cause. Well, what is the common factor in all of these anomalies? Let's go back to the Bible. Remember how we said initially that God created the heavens and stretched them out. One statement in the Bible occurs 12 times. It's important enough if we take the Bible as saying something even once. The fact, we have a number of examples here. We're told in Isaiah 42, 5, Thus saith the Lord God who created the heavens and stretched them out. Or Jeremiah 10, 12, God has made the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, stretched out the heavens at his discretion. Or Zechariah 12, 1, Thus saith the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. It's always in the context of creation week, and usually in the past tense. And the Hebrew action in, 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 in implied in all of that is that it's completed a, an action. So the first point to note from this is the expansion of the universe is already completed. In other words, the universe is not expanding now. It was completed at the end of creation week. In other words, we have a static cosmos. Now, this disagrees with majority astronomical opinion. But there is a number of minority uh, astronomers who hold that we do have a static cosmos, such as Nalika and Arp. In 1993, they pointed out that a static cosmos will be stable and will not collapse, but there will be slight oscillations of the cosmos. And we'll talk about this in detail tomorrow, but that is why we have this change in direction for the atomic constants in 1970. And this is in full agreement with the Bible, full agreement with the quantized redshift and other observational evidence that will be mentioned later. But let's return to the scriptural statement that God expanded the heavens. How does this cause the five anomalies that we've mentioned? To understand, we need to dig just a bit deeper. And let's see what's happening as the vacuum of space was stretched out. If I take a rubber band and stretch it, so I can hit the person in the back seat there, <laughs> I've actually added energy to the fabric of the rubber band. If I blow up a balloon, and let it go, 
You know what happens. I put energy into the fabric of the balloon. When God expanded the heavens, he put energy into the fabric of space, the vacuum of space, in the same way that energy has gone into the fabric of the balloon or the rubber band. But isn't space empty? Next one, love. Isn't space empty? Not really. If you take a sealable container, the 18th century view was that if you pump out all solids, liquids and gases, here's your vacuum pump, you pump, pump out all solids, liquids and gases out of your chamber, you should have a perfect vacuum. Well, in the 19th century, it was realised that there's going to be some temperature radiation in here. So if you have a refrigerator unit there put in and cool the container down to absolute zero, that is zero degrees Kelvin, about minus 273 degrees Celsius, or about minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit, you would then expect that you would have a perfect vacuum. But instead, can we go up, uh, just a bit further, love? Thanks. Instead, it finds that there's an intrinsic energy in the fabric of space. It's called the zero point energy because it was there even at absolute zero of temperature, zero Kelvin. Robin Ma Robert Matthews, a new scientist from 1995, described it as follows. The zero point energy, the ZPE, is a turbulent sea of randomly fluctuating electromagnetic fields or waves. At the macroscopic level, this level that you and I are used to, space is smooth or even featureless. But at the level of atoms, it's like a seething vacuum, like the spray around the bottom of a waterfall. Many physicists have calculated the energy in one cubic centimetre of the vacuum. And to coin a word, it's absolutely ginormous. Let me give you a feel for this. Here's one cubic centimetre. At home, I have lights which run from electricity at rated about 150 watts. The sun radiates at 2 million, 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 million times greater than that. In our galaxy, there are something like 150 billion stars, all radiating at approximately that rate. If you had all of our galaxy of stars radiating at that rate for one million years, that is the energy in one cubic centimetre of free space. And that is maintained for 20 billion light years in every direction. This is the energy that God has put into the fabric of space as a result of his stretching. The zero point energy, it's absolutely ginormous, it's incredible. And back in 1911, Max Planck demonstrated that Planck's constant, H, is a measure of the strength of the zero-point energy. And that energy has been proven to exist experimentally. It's called the Casimir effect. As you bring two metal plates close together in a vacuum, you find that there is a force tending to collapse the plates together. What is happening is that as you bring those plates together in a vacuum, you are effectively excluding those wavelengths of the zero-point energy which will not fit exactly between those plates. And that excluded radiation, those excluded wavelengths, are exerting a pressure on those plates which is collapsing them. So the closer the plates get together, the stronger the force. And it's been measured to within 1% accuracy in 1997 and 1998 by Lamoureux in some very beautiful experiments that were done. Um, incidentally, sailors notice the same effect when they're on the ocean. If they bring two boats closer together than one ocean wavelength apart, the boats tend to collide. So the Casimir force is a very strong at molecular distances and attracts and gives an attractive force between molecules. The zero-point energy manifests as noise in electronic circuits which limits amplification of signals. It also is the reason why you need pressure to solidify liquid helium. 
Well, if the ZPE is there, why don't we notice this all-pervasive bath of electromagnetic radiation? For the same reason that we don't notice the 15 pounds per square inch pressure on every part of our body due to the atmosphere. That pressure is balanced inside and out. And I can touch Penny with the lightest touch of the hand. It's nowhere near 15 pounds per square inch, but she notices that difference in pressure. And so it's only a difference that we get between this background zero-point energy. Anything over and above that is noticeable. But there's another important puzzle to solve. If God said he stretched out the heavens and gave rise to the ZPE as we had with the balloon and the rubber band, we've already noticed that Planck's constant H is measured as increasing with time. This means, if we take the values of H at face value, that the ZPE strength must have increased with time. One might ask why. Well, there's a very good reason why, and we'll return to this aspect of the topic in the workshop session. But for now, let me give you a rough analogy. If you put a cold plate of food into a hot oven, it takes a while for the food to build up to the temperature of the oven. As the ZPE builds up with time, for the same reason, the energy that was put into the fabric of space takes a while to manifest as the zero-point energy. So the ZPE builds up with time, and as it does so, the properties of the vacuum alter. Light speed slows down for reasons we'll give you tomorrow. Atomic clocks slow down for reasons we'll give you tomorrow. Planck's constants and atomic masses increase for reasons we'll give you tomorrow. And the redshift, remember where we started, the redshift actually decreases with time. It works with simple math, it works intuitively, it works biblically, it accounts for all the data, nothing has to be thrown out, we don't have, need to invent dark matter, dark energy, missing mass, or anything like that to support an invented failing theory. So tomorrow, we'll put it all together in the workshop session. And the time scales involved compared to the orbital period of time that we're used to measuring, the atomic times, we can actually supply a correction to these atomic dates. And when you do, a new cosmology emerges which allows us to harmonise astronomy and geology with the Bible. Thank you very much. ...which are fairly new, but they're based on data. And this is what I think has made very different from a lot of the other researchers in any field. I used to get it for both evolutionists and creationists. Barry is the only author, the only researcher I ever edited for who did not go very first and then try to cram the data into it. He has gone data first to find out where it leads. And it took an enormous amount of faith for him to do this. And that's faith in God to think that God did not lie in his university to have to be afraid of the data. He was be willing to go and see where it lived. I'm very proud of my husband and so Barry Setterfield. Thank you. afternoon is in three sections, three approximately one hour sections. Uh, first of all we'll briefly review what we did last night, so you'll see, you sort of catch you up as to what was happening last night. We'll move on from there to solve all those riddles and come down with some uh, final conclusion about this which will allow us then to talk about astronomy and geology and the time frames involved in those, uh, those processes and how everything happened in six literal days. Yes, we can, we've got experimental proof as to how this, how this all occurred in six literal days, the, the creation, and then how geology can be accounted for on the same basis. So astronomy and geology will be the two final sections uh, this afternoon, but the first section is catching up on what we did last night and uh, moving on just one stage further from that. So last night we were talking about uh, stretching the heavens, a new cosmology, and uh, we uh, were talking about the five, the importance of the five anomalies that uh, we had uh, listed up on the board of that stage. And the examination revealed that all five anomalies had one basic cause which must be factored into our scientific thinking. 
And when this is done, new cosmology emerges, and the billions of atomic years can be corrected and the time problem is resolved. So the first anomaly that we'll refocus our minds on uh, today is the decreasing values of light speed. Here's the uh, values of light speed given by, by Burge, who, as you remember, was the official keeper of the constants. The speed of light has successively dropped with time. And Verge didn't believe that the speed of light had changed, but these <coughs> were the measurements that he, the best corrected measurements that he could come up with for the speed of light, and he admitted that there was a change there which was greater than the error bars in the measurements. Yes. What are those numbers? Can't but, read on the. Those numbers up here? Yes. These are in uh, 299850 kilometres per second. These are kilometres per second up here. It goes up to 300,000 kilometres per second and down to about. Uh, 2997, something like that, 29790 kilometers per second. And that change has occurred. We had uh, this was 1940 and this one was 1870. And as you go back before the 1870s, the values that they were getting were even higher than that again. Uh, in fact, it's been something like a 1.5% change in about 350 years. So it's, it's something which is quite significant. Now, that's graph, the graph of Burge's recommended values. You compare that, thanks, sweetie, with the, the next graph, which is the Rydberg constant, which is an absolute constant. And there we find that measured values are scattered around a fixed value. No matter what your error bars were, this is pretty normal. You this is sort of scatter you expect. You have a couple of outliers, which is typical statistically, but there's no statistical trend in that. And that is so different from what we were getting with the speed of light. You had 16 different methods of measuring the speed of light. Each method considered as a whole had the trend down. Some, in some cases, the trend was shifted into a lower set of values, in others it was in a higher set of values. But the trend was still there. And when you put all the values together, it was still apparent that there was a trend. And so we come to the recommended values of Planck's constant, H. And uh, Planck's constant H is a measure of the jiggling of subatomic particles, which gives some sort of indefiniteness as to their position. And uh, so here's the values of Planck's constant trending up with time and cooling over around about 1970, as we pointed out last night. Again, this is not a scatter around a fixed point. You can obviously see a trend here. Yes? Can quite make out the numbers on this graph, either same dates on the bottom? Uh, this one is, let me see, 1930 to, uh, to, to, to 2000, and we have, uh, what is it, 6.021 6 to up to 6.627. 6 Okay, and then we have the recommended values of electron mass. Atomic particle masses are measured in a variety of different ways. One way, put very simply, is to expose an atom to it. Yes. What percentage of change is that in the plankton age? Uh, the plank constant change there, you're getting something like a 1% change. Okay, so we have the atomic particle masses, one way of measuring them is simply to expose an atom to, an, uh, to a magnetic field and see how much of an increase is necessary in that field to change the spin of an electron. So you have to overcome the electron's mass to get it to spin in the opposite direction. And there's a way of measuring this uh, using a spectroscope and the graph of uh, uh, atomic uh, rest masses or electron masses, again, trend of, that's, that's, that, that's that one great, actually. Again, it's trending up and curving over again around about 1970 there. Then we have uh, atomic time slowly compared to orbital time. The slow rate of ticking of atomic clock, clocks compared to orbital clocks was picked up by Van Flanden, who did the pioneering work back there in uh, 1980. 84, and what we have here, other observatories picked up this work, and yes, from the date here is 19, 1900 up to <coughs> 1995, 
notice here the trend, this is the atomic clock rate of ticking, okay? It's been slowing, came right down to about 1970 and then started climbing again. Something definitely is happening here with all of these atomic constants. Uh, this data was collected by Kolesnik and uh, Mazralias. And again, the, you see the, the, the change there, the, the difference in the rate of ticking is rather pronounced. The fifth anomaly that we mentioned was the quantization of the red shift. Light from distant galaxies has shifted down to the red end of the rainbow spectrum, as we mentioned last night. Does anyone need any further information about that? Are you all sort of caught up on what I did with that last night? Okay. So the further you go out, yes. You give a little bit more detail. Okay. There last night, so. Okay. The red shift, um, as you have a look at the rainbow spectrum uh, from the sun or from any star, if you look at that in detail, you see a set of lines on it from the various elements. Each element has its own characteristic set of lines like a barcode. Okay. These barcode lines are shifted down progressively further and further to the red end of the spectrum for galaxies further and further away from us. That's called the red shift. And it was assumed to be a Doppler shift. Uh, the galaxies were assumed to be racing away and stretching light to longer wavelengths. So this is like a Doppler effect. In other words, it was thought that the red shift was due to galaxy motion and this led to the idea of the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang and, and so on. Tift in 1976 pointed out that the red shift was not actually a smooth function. It was going in a series of steps. Uh, in other words, it was quantized. You had separate quantities for this value, it was rather like an apple falling off a tree at one mile an hour down to here, then five miles an hour down to there, and then from ten miles an hour down to there. This is something which doesn't happen under normal circumstances. The universe can't be expanding in jumps. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, gal in galaxy clusters you could actually measure the redshift quantization. But then as you came to the very centre of a galaxy cluster, like the Virgo cluster, the actual motion of the galaxies there was so, so quick, right at the very centre of the, uh, the cluster, because it was deep in the, in the uh, gravitational field, that the quantization was washed out by the motion. So redshift is not really due to motion. The quantization is washed out by motion. So we're getting something, we're getting something which is not gelling here. Quantization again cuts right through the centres of some galaxies, so that it means that if, gal if the redshift is due to motion and the, the change in the redshift is cutting through galaxies, these galaxies should be shearing in half, disrupting all sorts of things happening. We don't see this evidence. Some galaxies, and here's a key point which I think I missed last night. Some galaxies have actually shown a decrease in the redshift by one quantum jump over a period of time. Tift has measured this, yes, this was in 1991. This was, uh, this was measured in, and it was, uh, was uh, written up in a scientific journal. It was in um, Astrophysical Journal. But that, that appeared, I think it was in 1991. Now this is something which just cannot be accounted for. A change in the redshift an actual drop in the redshift. Now if the universe is meant to be expanding, and the current theory is swinging around to the belief that it's expanding faster now than it was in the past, if the redshift is due to expansion, and that expansion is faster, you would expect an increase in the redshift, not a decrease. So something is happening here that then we're not picking up on. And uh, so there's a real puzzle. So atomic orbit energies, uh, actually supply an, another possibility. If there's a discrete increase with time in atomic orbit energies, it would mean that your light is becoming progressively bluer with time, so that as we look back into the past, these orbit energies were lower and hence the light emitted would be redder. So instead of having galaxy motion, it might be due to the atomic emitters, the emitters of light within those galaxies. Okay. Struggling a bit on it. It does hurt a bit. <laughs> okay. Here's an alternative way of looking at it. If all the light from these galaxies is showing a red shift, and it's not due to motion, 
Where is the light coming from in the first place? It's coming from the stars, and the atoms within those stars are the ones which are emitting the light. So it must be all the atoms in all the stars in that galaxy which are systematically redshifted. The light from those orbits are redshifted, so those orbits must have lower energy. This is the primary basis of, uh, of what is happening. So, what was that? You're talking about the orbits of the electrons yeah, themselves. Yeah, slightly shifted. Yeah, yeah. So this is another possibility. Now we'll examine this in more detail in just a, in just a moment. You want to say something there, Mike? I said he'll be explaining why. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we have these five anomalies, all the children of the same parent, all have one thing in common. And as I mentioned before, the key is in the Bible. The statement that which occurs in the Bible 12 times uh, is that the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. There we have some of the references there. And as we look in these, at these references, it's always in the, cre in the uh, context of creation week. And it's always, except in two cases, in the past tense. So it means that this stretching out of the heavens is over and done with. It's completed, it's finished. The first thing to notice from this then is that the universe is not expanding now. We have a static universe. Yes? That's a question about the, the meaning of this word stretching, because um, one meaning of stretching is to be laying something out without time in any way. Stretching here seems to, I mean, this word implies some kind of tension. It, it, it implies uh, an elasticity, a, a sort of a tension in there, yes. Yes, you, you've got it, the Lord actually pulling things apart. So, uh, um, and as I say, this, this idea of the static cosmos goes against the majority of astronomical opinion. Um, but there is a minority opinion which says, yes, a static cosmos is stable against collapse, as Nalika and Art pointed out in 1993. But they said an oscillation will occur, a slight oscillation will occur. Now, this is in full agreement with the quantized redshift and the Bible. And so the actual cause of the redshift and how it links with the other anomalies we'll discover shortly. But let's return to this scriptural statement. And uh, as we mentioned last night, that if you stretch out a rubber band so that you can fire it at someone or do whatever you want, hit the camera with it, <laughs> um, you're actually investing the rubber band fabric of the rubber band with an energy, a tension, an energy. If you expand a balloon, blow up a balloon, the same thing is happening. Um, you're putting energy into the fabric of the, uh, the balloon, so you, when you release it, the balloon goes fast, slows down and, and stops. So you, this potential energy that you put into the fabric of the balloon or the rubber band can be expressed as a kinetic energy, the energy of motion, as it, uh, as it travels. Now God said he stretched the heavens, and if God not only increased the size of space at the beginning, but invested it with an enormous amount of energy, which is what is sort of implied by the statements we're getting here, physically, where is all that energy? It's in what we call the vacuum of space, in the same way it was in the fabric of the rubber band. But isn't space empty? Well, not really. The uh, idea back in the 18th century was that if you got a uh, sealable container, had a vacuum pump, and pumped out all solids, liquids and gases out of that, uh, uh, out of that uh, container, they thought you would have a, a, a complete vacuum. And then, in the 19th century, it was realised that there would be temperature radiation in there. So, okay, what you now do is to put a refrigerator onto the unit there, and cool this thing down to zero degrees absolute, zero degrees Kelvin, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, or about minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit. And they found that there, at absolute zero of temperature, you still have an intrinsic energy in the fabric of space. It's called the zero point energy because it's there at absolute zero of temperature. Robert Matthews, a new scientist in 1995, described it as follows. The ZPE, the zero point energy, is a turbulent sea of randomly fluctuating electromagnetic fields or waves. 
at a macroscopic level, the level that you and I are used to dealing with every day, the size of chairs and human beings and so on, space is smooth and even featureless. But at the scale of atoms, you find the zero point energy is absolutely um, very, uh, very active. You find that it's called the seething vacuum. Um, and the size of this energy is absolutely ginormous because as we pointed out last night, it's something in one cubic centimetre of free space. If you have all the stars in our galaxy, that's 150 billion of them, like our sun, and the sun is uh, radiating something like uh, two million, 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 million times more than what we're getting from our lights here, uh, 150 billion stars radiating like our sun for one million years is the amount of energy in one cubic centimetre of free space. And this is absolutely incredible. And this is maintained for 20 billion light years in every direction. This is the energy that God put into space when he initially expanded it out. And back in 1911, Max Planck demonstrated that Planck's constant that we saw on the board here is a measure of the strength of the ZPE, the zero point energy. And this energy has been proven to exist experimentally by the Casimir effect. And here's the Casimir effect diagram. What happens is that if you bring two, two uh, metal plates very close together in the vacuum, uh, you effectively exclude the wavelengths of the zero point energy that will not fit exactly between the plates. And as a consequence, those excluded wavelengths are exerting a pressure on the plates which is pushing them together. And the closer your plates come together, the greater that, that force is called the Casimir force. And uh, it was proven to exist experimentally uh, back in 1949. And it was measured accurately in 1997 by Lamoureux in a beautiful series of uh, uh, experiments. Now, Sailors notice a similar effect in, out on the ocean where you have two boats close together, yes. That amount of energy in a cubic centimetre? In a cubic centimetre, yep. This kind of energy is equivalent to all the light energy in the universe? Uh, it's equivalent to all of, the, um, all of our, the stars in our galaxy shining for one million years. Okay. And that's and what, what, where is that cubic centimeter located? <laughs> right here, any cubic exactly. centimeter, any cubic centimeter. But this is this is maintained right throughout the whole of the cosmos. Okay. And so this is the energy that was put in as a result of this stretching, this tension, which uh, which God put into space. There are a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to get this energy to work. Yeah, exactly. Unless you've got an energy differential. You can't. It's the same everywhere. It's the same everywhere, so you can't get it to work for you unless you have an energy differential. And if you have a cold sink where you can dump that energy and get it to work for you. Since it's isotropic, it's everywhere. You don't feel it like you don't feel air pressure on you. But what is it? And how do they measure it? It's, uh, well, the Casimir effect is one way of measuring it. The jiggling of atomic particles is another way because if you suspend an electron in a vacuum, for example, it's impacted by the waves of the zero point energy, hitting it from all directions and it jiggles around like this. It does a, a, a jitter motion. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So there are a number of ways of measuring this. Is it also true that uh, those that speak of strings and string theory talk of the vibration of the strings and somewhat related to this? Um, the vibration of the strings is not directly related to the CPE. String theory goes in a slightly different direction to what uh, what we're doing. I don't want to take them on a tangent. Right? No, no, that's the vibration. You mentioned vibration. Right, no, this, this vibration is something intrinsic to <laughs> intrinsic to all atoms, but it's different from the vibration that we have in the string theory. Okay. So, um, the, uh, as you bring these plates closer together, the, the force is greater, and at the scale of atoms and molecules, you find that there's a, a, this tremendous force which is pushing atoms and molecules uh, together, and this is known as the, uh, um, as the van der Waals forces in, in chemistry. And sailors notice the similar effect, the distance between two boats, if that's less than one ocean wavelength, the boats tend to collide, and you have the same effect happening there. 
The reason that the, the other manifestations of the ZPE is the reason that you need pressure to, solid, uh, to solidify liquid helium. Um, and uh, because the jiggling of the helium atoms is so great that unless this jiggling is overcome by pressure, you can't get helium to solidify. Um, it's the cause of quantum uncertainties. Now you might wonder what I mean by this. This is the, the jiggling movement of electrons. According to some physicists, um, if you try to measure the position of a particle exactly, you can't do it. And this is known as quantum uncertainty. And the reason for that uncertainty is in fact this jiggling due to the battering uh, waves of the ZPE. And as Penny said, we don't notice the ZPE because, no, uh, because we don't notice the uh, 15 pounds per square inch pressure from our atmosphere. It's inside and outside of our bodies. And uh, because this is uniform right throughout the whole universe, you don't, uh, you don't notice it. Now, there was one, uh, one important thing. We noted that Planck's constant H was measured as increasing with time. And because Planck's constant is a measure of the strength of the ZPE, it means that the ZP strength must have been increasing with time. What's going on? The answer is actually a two-step process. The ZPE was formed as a result of the second step in this stretching. To understand, we need two pieces of information. The first piece of information comes from Einstein. I think we're right from that, but the next one is not appropriate just yet. Um, to understand, we need two pieces of information. The first piece comes from Einstein. As the expansion occurs, energy was fed into the vacuum of space. Now, Einstein said that energy and matter are interconvertible. Okay? As a result of this stretching, energy being fed into the fabric of space, this energy formed the smallest possible particles that it is possible to form in our universe. Um, they are called Planck particles. They are unique. Planck particles are exceptionally small. They come in pairs because their space is electrically neutral. They're called Planck particle pairs, or PPPs. These Planck particle pairs are so small that if an electron, an electron was the size of the Golden Gate Bridge, a Planck particle would be smaller than a speck of dust on that bridge. You're getting a picture of how small these things really are? Okay. These are the smallest particles that our universe is capable of producing. Now please don't confuse Planck particles with Planck's constant. Planck was a very important physicist and gave his name to both of these things. But the Planck particle pairs have another unique characteristic. Some of the physicists have pointed out that these atomic particles have a wavelength associated with them. It's called the Broglie wavelength. For all of the other particles, their wavelength is different to their diameter. The exception is a Planck particle. A Planck particle has its wavelength equal to its diameter. It's the only particle in the universe with which that happens. So these particles are unique. And these particles were the ones which formed as a result of the energy going into the fabric of space. The second component of the puzzle is the role of turbulence or vorticity. Let's do another experiment. Expansion results in turbulence. If you put your hands together in a bath of water and pull them apart and lift them out of the water, what happens? The water churns up. Yeah, you get vortices, you get turbulence, you get whirlpools forming. And well, water swirls around and you'll notice something else This happens in three stages. First of all, there's the formation stage as you separate your hands. Then after you pull your hands out, there's the persistence. It goes on. The whirling goes on. And then it decays. So there are three phases to this. So they persist for a long time. So you notice the same effect with aircraft. This is a light aircraft, but here is the vortices set up by the motion of the wings of the aircraft. Look at this. Absolutely enormous. With a Boeing 777, that turbulence lasts for seven minutes and it is not safe to land another plane behind a Boeing 777 for five minutes. This is how 
So this is the persistence and the, and the decay stages of these vortices. So let's return to the stretching of space and try and visualize what's happening. Carl Gibson in the University of uh, California at San Diego uh, noted the role that turbulence played with plant particle pairs in the expansion of the vacuum and he presented at a conference in 2001 in a discussion he showed how plant particle pairs could form in, the, in a cascade resulting from expansion conditions. The initial expansion produced plant particle pairs. As the expansion continued, these plant particle pairs started whirling around. There was turbulence there. And he was able to show that while there was turbulence, you'll get more plant particle pairs forming because this turbulence is part of the energy which is going into the expansion of space. And while there's energy there, you're going to get more and more particles forming until all of the energy is used up. But then something else is happening as well. Plant particle pairs are positively and negatively charged. So after the turbulence is all over and done with, we've got plant particle pairs in their maximum numbers, you're going to get the plant particle pairs recombining. Yes? Where are these particles formed from? These form, uh, form from the energy which actually goes into the expansion. The energy from, is forming particles. Yeah, the, the, the E equals MC squared. The E equals MC squared. Okay. Can, can you just brief background on the PPP? How, how were they discovered? When were they discovered? Okay, plant particle pairs have been, have been known to exist for quite some time. Um, the exact discovery, I'm not sure exactly how that worked out, but it's just uh, that we know theoretically we can do our calculations with these things. They're pretty small. What we have tried to do is, as we look out to the front ends of, of space, uh, plant particle pairs should in fact have given rise to slight fuzziness in some of our photos. And they're looking at, uh, at this as a, a means to, but there's a reason why they're not picking up the fuzziness that I'll come to in just a second. And uh, so, okay, the, as the strength of ZP, what happened then was that the opposite plant particle pair charges attract. And when they recombine, they send out a pulse of electromagnetic energy. And this is where the ZPE is coming from. And so as this recombination process occurs, until this recombination process is finished, the electromagnetic energy from their recombination is going to build up and build up, the ZPE is going to build up. The ZPE is also going to build up as a result of the turbulence. When you have the first plank particle pairs there, positively and negatively charged, you have an electric field between them. And as they're whirling around, you've got a magnetic field. So this is the electromagnetic field of the initial ZPE. So you have two mechanisms by which the ZPE is going to build up. The first is due to turbulence, and the second is due to recombination. Okay. So we now have the basic mechanism in place. The ZPE is going to build up with time because of these mechanisms. Yeah, just one moment. When you say positively and negative charge, is that electrical charge? Yes, electrical charge. Positively and negatively charged electrically. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar to a proton and a proton. Yeah, very similar. A very similar process, but we're talking at a whole scale of magnitudes, much, much smaller, much, much smaller. Yeah, we'll talk about them in just a minute. We're coming right onto that, that topic right now. But yeah, we're, we're talking about recombination of um, something like particle anti particle pairs. Now, the question is. How does this affect light, uh, light speed and atoms? What does it have to do with the redshift and why is radioactive decay involved? Well, let's have a look at the speed of light first. The strength of the, uh, of the ZPE determines the speed of photons, light photons, traveling through the vacuum. Again, the reason is linked with Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. We learn that matter and energy are interconvertible. What this means in practice is that the ZPE strength allows local manifestations of particle and particle pairs such as our friend we talked about here. What is happening, the waves of the ZPE, you know what happens in the oceans where the waves sort of meet and come to a climax and get some froth at the top? At these points in the ZPE in space, you're actually getting this particle and particle pairs for Okay, they're electron-positron pairs or, a pos uh, or positive and negative ions or, or whatever. You've got a whole zoo of particles out there, form, virtual particles forming, recombining, sending off the energy again. So these 
these virtual particles, um, as, uh, as they're called, are, are rather like the spray from uh, at the bottom of a waterfall. And these are giant particles compared to the plate particle pairs that we were talking about. Um, they flash into an, an out of existence, these virtual particles, and space is continually filled with their incessant coming and going. And this is why space is sometimes called the seething vacuum. Now, remember that God invested space with uh, this energy when he stretched it. That potential energy has been converted into active or kinetic energy by the ZPE. And that increasing ZPE means that more and more virtual particle pairs are forming within each small volume of space, within a fixed volume of space at a given time. What that means is that photons have an increasing number of virtual particle pairs to negotiate as they travel through the vacuum. In any one small part of the vacuum, you have literally billions of these virtual particles. As a photon of light goes through, it hits a virtual particle, it's absorbed, the particle recombines, the photon is re-emitted, goes on its way, hits the next particle, things combine, goes on its way. So you have something like um, a runner going over hurdles. You've got, um, if you have a straight 100 yards to run, you can do it in a pretty fast time, something like 9 seconds or 8 seconds. If you have a number of hurdles to go over, it's going to take you longer. The more hurdles you have, the longer it's going to take you. And this is what's happening with the speed of light. Between the hurdles, it's going at the same speed. But the problem is, every time it goes over a hurdle, every time it is absorbed by a virtual particle, it takes, it's, it takes a finite time for that thing to recombine and re-emit the photon and for the thing to go on its way. You've got billions of these events happening in just a very, very small set, segment of space. So, okay, these tiny amounts of time add up and actually end up measuring the difference in the speed of light. And this is what the experimenters have been measuring over the last 300 years. The CPE strength has been increasing, so the speed of light has been decreasing because you have more virtual particle pairs for the photon of light to negotiate as it goes through space. Now, we uh, recall that we spoke of Planck's constant age increasing at the same time as C was decreasing. Planck's constant was increasing, speed of light decreasing. Yes. So is this increase in ZPE related to increase in entropy? Is that... um, not directly. Not directly, no. Um, entropy... It's not, no. The simple answer is no, it's not directly related in that case. But Entropy has to do with the evening out of temperature. Right. It sounds like that's what you're talking about. So this the is evening a, out of energy in the universe. This is a building up of kinetic energy due to electromagnetic combining and recombining. Okay. Now, Planck's constant was measured, a measure of the strength of the ZPE. And Planck's constant was measured as increasing with time. But the speed of light was measured as decreasing with time. So that Planck's constant time, the speed of light, turned out to be an absolute constant when we, do our, uh, when we do our measurements. And now you can see why. One's increasing and the other is decreasing exactly for the same reason. When you put them both together, you get an absolute constant as a result. So H times C in the physicist's equation, Planck's constant time the speed of light, is an absolute constant and it is right to the frontiers of the cosmos. We've measured it to one part in 100,000 and it's absolutely constant. Well, so the increase in the ZP is the root cause of atomic behavior. And it solves the redshift anomaly in increasing atomic masses. So why should atomic masses increase then if the ZPE is increasing? Well, it depends what you call by mass. Physicists have looked at this problem for quite some time. They have always considered atomic particles such as an electron or a proton or a neutron or a quark or quark as however you like to pronounce this. Okay, you have these as charged point particles. Okay, charged point particles without mass intrinsic to themselves. The problem has been for physicists to get these particles to have mass. It's just recently been discovered in the last 10 years 
it must has actually come from the ZPE. As the battering waves of the ZPE hit these, the, the, hit these atomic particles, these subatomic particles, these particles jiggling around doing a dance. That dance is called the Zitterbewerger in German. <laughs> it sort of rolls off the tongue, gives you a, a nice feeling when you say it. Um, it's, uh, it literally means jitter motion. Jitter motion. You've got these particles dancing around. And this jitter motion is the origin of what some scientists call quantum uncertainty. It gives a, an indefiniteness in position for uh, uh, any given particle. And this jiggling motion is caused by the ZPE. So when the ZPE is stronger, you've got more battering waves pelting on these objects, and they're jittering around faster. Okay. What is happening is that these particles have been given a kinetic energy of their own, a, a kinetic energy which they didn't have before, by the ZPE. And this energy can be measured, can appear as mass. Again, Einstein's famous equation. The energy given to these subatomic particles by the ZPE is battering around, this kinetic energy appears as mass. And this is where mass comes from on, a, and on an atomic level. It's actually from this jitter motion due to the ZPE. Am I making sense here? Are you following what I'm, what I'm talking about? So more more zero motion means right the mass. Yeah. They're taking up more space. They're jiggling a little harder, taking up a little bit more space, so it appears as So as the ZPE increases, atomic masses increase. Now, as you do your math on this, you can show that the atomic mass is proportional to Planck's constant squared, Planck's constant multiplied by itself, or 1 over the speed of light squared, because Planck's constant and the speed of light are inversely related. Hc is a constant. If H goes up, C goes down, inversely related. So that if mass is proportional to H squared, it's proportional to 1 over C squared. Hey, notice something? Einstein's equation is E equals mc squared. So as C squared goes down, m goes up in direct proportion. So energy is maintained constant in this whole process. So when the ZP is lower and C is higher, the, gener the energy generated by a given atomic process is not going to be greater. So you're not going to blow your universe to, to smithereens when you have a very high value for the speed of light. And this leads on to the behavior of atomic clocks. Energy again is conserved in atomic processes. So consider electrons in their orbits or nucleons in their orbitals, in the nucleus. Kinetic energy is conserved so that if their mass increases, their velocity must decrease. So the velocity of electrons in their orbits or nucleons in their orbitals can be shown to be proportional to the speed of light. So as the speed of light drops, because of the CPE, because the speed of light drops, so does the velocity of the particles in their orbits. And the velocity of particles in their orbits is the way that the atomic clock works. So that the atomic clock is going to tick more slowly because mass, atomic masses have increased, and as a consequence, atomic clocks are ticking at a rate proportional to the speed of light. The whole thing fits together. And this is another way of looking at this is the radioactive decay. The creationists have done an excellent job with many of the problems that radiometric dating has. However, we do have a lot of concordant dates, and I have a friend who is a creationist who is actually in a radiometric dating laboratory and he does this job. And he points out that there's something like an 80% consistency rate in this. So we do have a problem that's got to be addressed. And with zircon crystals, it's perfectly possible to explain what is happening with a changing ZPE, for example. Equations, all equations related to radioactive decay, have either Planck's constant in the numerator, or the speed, or Planck's constant in the denominator, or the speed of light in the numerator. 
And when you look at this, it means that as the speed of light shift slows down, as the ZPE increases, the rate of a radioactive decay is also decreasing. An increase in the ZPE means a slowing rate of radioactive decay. So atomic clocks and uh, radioactive decay all sort of tick in the same way. Your radioactive decay is proportional to the speed of light. So it's important to understand then what happens with atoms in the ZPE. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, that's, uh, that's right. Yes. So, so if you're measuring the speed of light with, with an atomic clock, it's constant. Exactly. This is a problem that we had since about 1970. Oh, uh, right. That's okay. Right. This, is why I looked at, this is why I looked to be constant for them. Right. Okay. And this is why I just declared an absolute constant in 1983. They didn't have any, any discordant measurements. Okay. Now, okay, so we've mentioned four of the five anomalies. The fifth anomaly is the red shift. And let's come to it by the behavior of atoms. It's important to understand what happens with atoms in the ZPE. There are a number of different views of the atom, but the one that I'm going to use here is the one that you're all familiar with from school, you know, the Bohr model of the atom. Um, and you can show that if the math works there, it can be tweaked to get agreement with more sophisticated models. What is important here is that electrons are in groups at specific distances from the uh, nucleus of their atom, and all models agree with that. The link between atomic behavior and the ZPE was demonstrated in 1987 by Hal Puddle from the Institute of Advanced Studies in uh, Austin, Texas. Here's the top of Hal Puddle's head. I'm sorry, I couldn't get the whole photograph. But what he was saying is, okay, science has got a problem because according to classical electromagnetic theory, as an electron goes around in its orbit, it should be radiating energy, and as it radiates energy, it should spiral into the nucleus, and the whole thing disappear in a flash of light. Well, this doesn't happen. And when you ask a quantum, well, we know it doesn't happen because we're here. <laughs> uh, when you ask a quantum physicist why it doesn't happen, he says because when an electron is in a stable orbit, it doesn't radiate energy. And then you say, well, why doesn't it radiate energy? He says, because the, the quantum laws say that it doesn't. And you say, well, what do those laws actually mean? And you find the fellow starts fumbling a bit to give an explanation. Now, Pato said, all right, let's face this head on. Let's assume that classical electrodynamics is correct. And the electron is, in fact, radiating energy as it goes around in its orbit. And let's calculate the energy that it should receive from the zero point energy that we know now exists. You do your calculation and it turns out that the energy lost is equal to the energy gained. It's like a kid on a swing. Just as the swing starts slowing down, the adult gives it another push and keeps the thing going. The ZPE is in fact keeping the whole thing intact. And Someone put it this way, I haven't time to go into this in detail, but someone put it this way, it was Della Penner, I think. He said that you can consider it like this. If an electron is too far out in its orbit, it radiates more energy than it receives from the ZPE and moves into something stable. If it's too close into the nucleus, it receives more energy from the ZPE than it's radiating, and so it moves out to a stable orbit. In other words, it is the ZPE which is maintaining atomic stability right throughout the cosmos. You remember what it says in Hebrews 1.3, Colossians 1.17? Christ maintains the whole universe, the whole order, by the word of his own power. Yes? Also, what maybe keeps like all the protons jammed in the nucleus together. Yeah, it, it works in exactly the same way. You can put, in fact, there's a the whole branch of physics developing on just on this topic right now. And it seems that we can unify a whole host of branches of physics under this one phenomenon using the ZPE. It's, it's a very exciting time to be living in. One of my friends said that, who is a physicist uh, over in, uh, in Australia, he said, if I wasn't involved in the work that I am involved in and I can't pull out of, he said, I'd be going into this area of physics to, uh, to find out what's happening. He said, this is, this is absolutely fantastic stuff. So, okay. With atoms so dependent on the ZPE, we need to consider what are the effects of an increasing ZPE on the energy available to atoms so that with stable orbits you would expect perhaps that they would have higher energy values as the ZPE increases. Okay, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> 
So is this related to electron shells? This related electron to electron shells? Electron shells, yes. Yeah. What? What we have here. I can exert some pressure on this and it doesn't move. As I increase the pressure, suddenly it jerks forward. There is a threshold of energy that has to be overcome before I get this thing to move. The same thing is happening with atoms. The same thing is happening with atoms. Atoms will resist a change until it's overcome by the increased accessibility of energy. Just as in the law of inertia, there's a threshold of energy which needs to be overcome before it can change. The atom will finally react with a jump to a higher energy level once that threshold has been reached. In the meantime, at this point here, while it's resisting the change, everything is going to move in such a fashion that energy is conserved. At this point here, when a jump occurs, the atom has a slightly higher energy value than what it did before. The, um, the energy in the orbit, uh, because the ZP is isotropic everywhere and the same throughout the universe, all atoms are going to, res to uh, react simultaneously. Atoms in the higher energy state get more energetic or blue or light. Therefore, the more distant the object, the redder the emitted light is going to appear to be. And we will see the light appear to be redder in jumps as we look further and further back. And this is what we see with the redshift in space. It's all due to the ZPE, the increase in the ZPE with time. The atom has taken up successively higher and higher energy states. Very, very small changes, but successively higher and higher. So that as we look back in time, we're seeing the energy getting lower and lower and lower in jumps. And this is what the red shift is. And this is why, this is why you can get a change in the red shift in some galaxies. There's actually a drop in red shift in time. This is why, because the ZP has increased. The whole thing fits, into, uh, fits together. And this is exactly what uh, occurs, and as you do your theoretical work, it turns out that the uh, the size of this ZPE, uh, the size of the uh, redshift jump that Tift worked out, agrees uh, with the theory. He had 2.66 kilometres per second. Theoretically, it's 2.67 kilometres per second. We're within a very small fraction of a percent of being able to calculate what the redshift jump, the uh, quantum, quantum jump in the redshift, is going to be. And so, what we have with the redshift, next uh, slide, not. So what we have with the redshift is actually the inverse of the behaviour, if this is out to the front of the universe, redshift is doing this, this is the inverse of the behaviour of the ZPE. And so no one argues as well that further out in space you're looking at increasing distances, so we're looking backwards in time. So this graph can be converted to redshift against time simply by rescaling the axis, the horizontal axis here. So redshift against distance and redshift against time are basically the same thing. But there is one very important development. It was pointed out by one of my critics a few years back that what we have here is the relativistic Doppler formula, talking about the racing away of galaxies. He said you can't use that formula because it has, what you're talking about has nothing to do with velocities and movement. He said, you can't, what, what formula are you going to use? You can't use that formula. Well, what we did, we looked at the way the ZPE builds up in time. The ZPE builds up because of turbulence, and the ZPE builds up because of recombination. You put, there, both of these, uh, both of these things have mathematical formula which are exact. We put these formulas together. When you put them together in the appropriate way for the ZPE, it turns out that you get the inverse of the Doppler equation. This has nothing to do with motion of galaxies. This simply has to do with recombination and turbulence. You get the inverse of this, this formula. So you get the redshift behaving just exactly this way 
for entirely different reasons to what astronomers were thinking. And the advantage is that up at this point here where things are getting dicey as far as the astronomers are concerned, we've got a bit of leeway that we can play with in some of these formulas. There are several, uh, several possible options here. Oh, we can get this graph going up slightly uh, steeper. And the astronomers can't do that with the, uh, with the Doppler formula. Well, that was published in a paper entitled A Redshift from the Zero Point Energy by Dr. Daniel Zamano and myself. Daniel was a tutor in math at Flinders University at the time helped make that possible. So the graph of the, of the, the inverse of the ZPE with time is the graph of the redshift against distance, but for the reasons which have nothing to do with velocities. So the correct graph holds the answer to the cosmological problems that we've been discussing. So the final graph there, Mark. We saw a few minutes ago that if the CPE was less, so was the energy of the atom and the light emitted was redder. We also saw that light travelled faster through space with a lower CPE because there were fewer virtual particles. And so the speed of light, the high red shift, are both directly linked and both inversely proportional to the, speed, to the uh, CPE. But so what we have here, the behaviour of the CPE and Planck's constant and the direct behaviour of redshift as atomic clock rates, the velocity of light. This is the redshift, velocity of light, atomic clock rates, and the inverse of that is Planck's constant, atomic masses, and the ZPE. So that formula, that equation, tells us exactly how things are behaving right back to the origin of the cosmos. Look at the dramatic drop, how, how quickly this thing was dropping at the start. And this means that the atomic clock was ticking incredibly fast right back there at the origin of the cosmos. It means they are ticking off millions of atomic years in just a few orbital years. And we can use the mathematical process of, called integration, which we travel back along the curve. And when you do that, you can find out what the atomic clock was at any given time, what it was written back at any given orbital time in the past. And when you do that, a surprising thing turns out. All atomic dates can be brought down to a recent creation time. And all of your astronomical phenomena can be accounted for in a period of less than 10,000 years. In fact, it's even considerably less than 10,000 years. So, okay, well, next slide. The astro astronomical and geological model which emerges from the redshift light speed correction is very consistent. And we'll see exactly how this works in the next two sessions. Yes? What does that do to our estimate of astronomical distances? It, it doesn't change astronomical doesn't distances change at all, no. No change in astronomical distances. Because that chart's the same as the Doppler effect? Yeah. Yes. This is very exciting because I read uh, Dr. Gerald Schroeder's book about time warping in presence of great mass and all of that kind of stuff. And this fits beautifully with that. He's got the exact inverse of what yes. uh -huh. he's got the inverse of what we're talking about here. Yes. It so it's within those six days. Yeah. So this happens this whole thing happened. I'll I'll show you in the next session how you can actually get galaxies and so on in six literal days. It's actually been experimentally done. Yes. Daniel Zamano, D-Z-I-M-A-N-O. We wrote a, a paper entitled The, the uh, Redshift of the Zero Point Energy, and it was uh, published by the journal Theoretics back in, I think it was uh, 2003. D-Z or D-Z-I-M-A-N-O. Okay, you'll find it on our website, www.setafield.org. All our published papers are there on our website. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to keep it light. I'm trying to bridge between when there was an emission of blue light with increased CPE or CPE, yes, whatever it is, yeah. and then there's such showing a redshift. I can't quite bridge that. Okay. It's emitting more blue light. Why would it redshift? Because it's emitting more and more blue, uh, bluer and bluer light as we come forward in time. But as we look at distant galaxies, we're looking back in time. So it's going to be uh, here to be redder and redder and redder further back in the past. If it's getting more blue as you come forward in time, getting redder. Is that simple? Is that simple? This explains why we can see light from stars that are farther than the, farther away than the speed of light would say that they would be. Yeah, that's right. We can get light back from the most distant parts of the galaxy and most distant parts of the universe in less than ten thousand years. 
Right. And this is why yeah, astronomers. Are have, away. Uh -huh. right. This is why some astronomers have said uh, a high value for the speed of light at the inception of the cosmos really answers a whole host of their problems. Um, Distances of our galaxy. Yeah, how just uh, how how can one part of the universe be in contact with another part of the universe uh, when it's expanding so fast? Um, well, the speed of light was high, and it made it so so very much more possible. And the interesting thing is, these guys are talking about a speed of light something like ten to the sixtieth, one followed by sixty zeros, faster than what it is today. The actual evidence that we're talking about here from the wrenches and everything else only shows 6 by 10 to the 11 faster. That's what? 6, 600, 6 by 10 to the 11, 600 billion, uh, 600 billion times faster. And, yeah, and so it means that the atomic clock at the, at the moment of the inception of the cosmos right during creation week was ticking 600 billion times faster. And by the time Adam was there, everything had slowed down somewhat do something like uh, uh, 10 million times its current speed. But it's, yeah. How do they explain this in, in reference to the Big Bang? Because that seems to contradict totally the energy forming of the Big Bang. Is it The whole idea of the, the Big Bang was formulated way before they had taken the ZPE into their calculations. And they are now trying to uphold a theory which is becoming a little bit unwieldy, a little bit difficult to maintain. And because so many folk have got their PhDs on examining the Big Bang as we, uh, as we understand it today, um, they, the paradigm has got to be maintained. Are you going to throw out the theory or are you going to throw out the data? As I was speaking about last night, these guys are prepared to throw out the data in order to save the theory because the theory has got to be saved so that evolution is true. We can't have a creator. I actually came across this whole problem back in Australia. On one occasion I was talking to a professor about the speed of light work that I've been doing. And he looked at the graphs and so on. He said, well, the graphs are pretty convincing. But he said, Barry, even if we knew for sure that God created the whole universe in six literal days and 24 hours each in the recent past, it would be the duty of science to find an alternative explanation. I said, that is not why I went to high school and university. I went there to find out the truth about the natural order around us. Yes. If I went that much faster earlier, does that mean the CPE was really low then? Yes, this is, this is a, a, as it was the graph that we had there showed it was the uh, ZPE was very, very low, so the speed of light was very high. We only had a few virtual particles and so on. And we, yeah. It's like when you let go of a rubber band. The first, you know, that, that first initial thrust has to build up even as fast. But then it slows down the time and falls. Now do you want to break before we begin into our next session? Okay, let's begin then with talking about stars and galaxies and zoom into the solar system and then the third session we'll talk about the Earth itself. Because I saw... Yeah. Oh my god. That should be around that one. <laughs> that is the Southern Cross. That's the Southern Cross here. And the Milky Way and the Southern Cross. You can see what you guys are missing up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Down there it's really beautiful. Okay. <laughs> well, I love America more than Australia, I can tell you that. You guys, you guys have freedoms here which we don't have over there. You don't know how lucky you are. It's a far better environment to, to teach and to preach and to learn. And, anyway. So, okay. But we don't have the Southern Cross. You don't have the Southern Cross, no. As one astronomer wrote to me when I was back in Australia, he said, he writing from the Northern Hemisphere, he said, Barry, I envy you the Southern Skies. <laughs> so, okay, a consistent story seems to emerge which may indicate that we have the makings of a viable model uh, in consistency with the Bible. 
So if we want to explore possibility with you and look at somewhat, somewhat, uh, a somewhat different approach to Genesis 1. Okay. We begin with Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You're all familiar with those words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, time. God created bara, something out of nothing. The heavens, shemayim, which means some, that which is high or lofty or lifted up. And the earth, which means that, which is the word erect, which means that which is firm. So in the beginning, time, God created from nothing space and matter. So if we can actually see in these words here, space, matter, time, continuum which Einstein spoke about around about 1920. The Bible was way, way ahead of that. We have the space-matter-time continuum, but we have something else here. We have space, we have the earth matter. If matter means the stuff making up the universe, we have something very important in the next verse. The translation says, And the earth, Eretz, matter, was without form and void. Literally, formless and vacuous. If matter, well, for a start, this gets away from the idea that we have a, a spherical shaped earth at this point in time. It just doesn't exist there like that. It has no form. Matter has no form and it's vacuous. If you apply this to atoms, it means that the atoms cannot have any form. Which means that your electrons and your protons and your neutrons and your other bits and pieces must be wandering around on their own, disconnected. Okay? Matter is without form and void. Vacuous. Now, there's only one state of matter that we know that is like that. We're familiar with solids, liquids and gases. But there is a fourth state of matter called plasma. And this is exactly what matter is like when it's formless and vacuous. You have plasma television. Plasma screens. You, it's made up of a, a, a cold plasma behind the screen there. The, the atoms are formless and vacuous. These fluorescent lights have got a plasma in the middle of that tube once the current is gone. The sun itself is a plasma. So plasma is nothing strange, but it is a, the fourth state of matter which um, usually is not spoken about all that much. And matter is just subatomic particles, plus and negative and positive, wandering around on their own at a high temperature. Now, another line of reasoning comes to the same conclusion. God says 12 times that he stretched the heavens. It's uh, in the past completed tense. And we talked about the rubber band. We talked about the three types of uh, things for the vacuum. We've been through all that. And the ZPE was caused by stretching. And we need the ZPE to actually have atoms forming because it's the ZPE which supports atoms and at this point in time the stretching is only just beginning the ZPE has not formed so atoms could not exist as we know them today so yes it had to be a plasma so okay the heavens stretched out the plasma is in turbulent motion the hands in the bath business that we've talked about earlier. Genesis 1, 2, when Genesis 1, 2 says there was darkness upon the face of the deep. That word deep is the word to home in Hebrew, which means a surging, swirling mass. Note at this point, the Big Bang has problems. Let me explain why. If you start with a high temperature, the protons and electrons cool off, and hydrogen and helium form and a bit of beryllium and a little lithium. But the, the Big Bangers can't get anything beyond beryllium and lithium. 
So they have to build up all their other elements inside the stars. Now it's true that stars do build up other elements inside them and explode them out. But this causes them some problems because they have to have the first stars formed and explode out before the second generation of stars forms that have metals, other, other elements in them. They have a problem there. But the Bible's way ahead of them. The Bible says water was there upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded over the face of the waters. If you have a water plasma instead of a proton electron plasma, if you have a water plasma made up of the constituents that we have making up the atoms of water, it turns out an amazing thing is discovered by Professor Ed Bodro, Professor of Chemistry from Louisiana State University. Ed Bodro is able to show that with a water plasma at a high temperature, all the elements that we have in the universe in their known abundance can be formed in just 30 minutes. Three, zero minutes. In less time than it takes to cook roast turkey and potatoes. So, can you go over that one more time? Water and water and plasma? A water plasma. A water, a plasma made from water. A plasma, just hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen in the, in the ratio H2O, you can actually form these other elements because you've got additional particles to play with. That was Professor Ed Bodro, B-O-U-D-R-E-A-U-X. ICR. That's it. Yep. Yep. Basically, where you have this disassociated, you know, H2O constituents of H2O, exactly, completely in a plasma. Yeah, cloth, and then just things fall out of it. I suppose. Well, you have to get the interaction between the particles. You have nuclear interactions, and so on. You form as the thing cools down. You get these interactions, and you get uh, these uh, these other elements formed. Right, and it matches the ratio of what we see. Exactly. Yeah. So cool. Isn't it marvelous? <laughs> Yes. Do you happen to know if that water plasma is if the oxygen is uh, hydrogen is completely separate? Or do you have H and OH like you would find in normal water? Okay, what you have, these particles at uh, this stage because uh, um, yeah. they're, they're, they're not even they're not even atoms, all they are are the constituents that we have which make up water as isolated particles. Gotcha. In that ratio. Okay. Now um, now in Genesis 1-2 we're told the Spirit of God vibrated, moved or shook or hovered or brooded over the surging mass of the, uh, the tahon, over the surging mass of the plasma. Note the idea of vibration came from the idea of a bird with wings hovering or vibrating. But this is a very inadequate translation. As it turns out the Septuagint Greek translation of the, he of the, uh, the Hebrew in Genesis gives a word which is used in Acts 27, 15 and uh, verse 17 and 27 as well, which is the same word which is used in the Greek there back to describe what we have here in Genesis. You remember what happened in Acts, 20, in, in Acts 27? You had Paul in his, uh, in his ship being driven before this wind called Eurocleton. And this is probably one of the most powerful words you could possibly have used. And so instead of a brooding, hovering, fluttering type thing, you actually have this immense force at work driving this plasma. So you have the driving force of the Holy Spirit with this ongoing expansion. And the expansion plus vibration plus the sound waves gives you plasma in motion. And plasma in motion, you have your positive and negative charges, you have electric currents, and you have magnetic fields. This is typical of what we have in the, in the plasma. And we know from a laboratory experiment that uh, electric currents and magnetic fields concentrate the plasma into filaments. You actually have these filaments forming. And uh, this is the, uh, it turns out that this is the, uh, the same everywhere. You have the same basic behavior of plasma down here on Earth on, this, uh, on a laboratory scale or up in our atmosphere or in magnetospheres around the planets 
or out in space in the clouds and, and, of galaxies and so on out there. You have exactly the same thing happening. So we can upscale what happens in the laboratories here, we can upscale to a universe-sized standard with our plasma experiments. Um, it's um, shown that you have the same basic patterns of behaviour maintained, maintained over, over an enormous number of uh, uh, factors of 10, actually 10 to the 18. So we can upscale what we do in the laboratory to what happens to plasma out in space. But okay, let's have the next slide, love. Now we have an additional factor. The electric and magnetic properties of space were different from now. Expansion was continuing and the strength of the ZPE. Um. <laughs> you can see the filamentary structure that you have there out in space. This is a plot of galaxies. You see this filamentary structure? This is typical of the sort of thing that you get plasma forming. Here we have an enlargement of uh, one of these. Uh, you have these sort of cells. Of, or like the surface of bubbles, almost. And what happens is that as you put sound through a plasma, you get this sort of thing forming. Sound waves, and scientists have picked up the fact that there is sound waves out there in deep space at the moment of the inception of the cosmos. And this, the wavelength of these sound waves was so long, it was something like 220 thousand light years long to form these sorts of filaments. 220,000 light years. That is 50 octaves below our voice range. We are actually seeing here probably the voice of God. When God said, and this is what happened, when he was actually speaking into the plasma. And one scientist actually, one scientist actually said, perhaps we can actually work out what the message is if we can. <laughs> we've already got it here in the Bible. <laughs> he was saying we need something like a thousand characters to be able to actually work out. Yeah. When, when you give that estimate of the, the wavelength, is that taking into account the new cosmology with faster time? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Now when the ZPE was low, the speed of light was very high, so today space is thicker since it, the strength of the ZPE is much greater, so we have a C, a speed of light which is very low compared to creation. Now the important thing is that the particles making up the plasma travel almost at the speed of light. And the electric and magnetic fields are altered in their strength by the ZPE strength in proportion to the speed of light. This means the charged particles could move almost 1.5 billion light years in one day in a plasma with a high speed of light. Are you beginning to get the drift of what might happen? In our labs, We've shown the, elect the action of electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields on filaments of plasma, and we can reproduce the astronomical objects as a result of this plasma, the action of the electric and magnetic fields. What we do in the laboratory is take two filaments of plasma. Now, a filament of plasma will have an electric current going down vertically and a magnetic current tend to squeeze the thing horizontally. This plasma, if you have two filaments, as you'll see on the, on the slide which is coming up, if we have two filaments, we get two things interacting. If they've done it up to 12 filaments. As two filaments out in space or in the laboratory, they allow them to interact, they come close together. The first thing which is formed Here's where the filaments are, here and here, 
the first thing which is formed is what is called a double radio galaxy. <coughs> I find this absolutely amazing. The interaction over a series of time, over the interaction of these two filaments over a period of time, starts producing a variety of astronomical objects. We actually have a sequence of events and a series of objects completely consistent with what we see out in space, just by the interaction of these filaments. So, we have the sequence of two filaments here, the electric current and so on. The first configuration is a double radio galaxy. Then, as the filaments get closer and closer together, this gets more compressed, and you get a quasar forming. Now, a quasar are the central cores of mature galaxies today, but originally, they were the nucleus around which scientists thought the galaxies formed. You have, these are the, the most ultra-brilliant, hyperactive centers of galaxies that we see out the front of the cosmos. We can pick these things up right at the very, uh, uh, very, very early in the, uh, uh, in the moments after the uh, creation event. The, each galaxy actually had its own quasar at the center to start with. What has happened over a period of time, the activity has died down. We have a black hole left in here, which emits uh, X-rays and radio and so on. Uh, and we still have a black hole in the center of our galaxy, which is emitting X-rays sporadically. We had a black hole. We had a, a quasar like this at the center of our galaxy. And these quasars are so brilliant, they are equivalent to roughly 1,000 times the brilliance of the whole galaxy. This is some enormous, brilliant light. Okay, so what happens as your, as your uh, filaments get closer together, you get these quasars. Okay. Next one. Here is the sequence of events. Look at what's happening. You get the filaments coming closer and closer together. Here's your double radio galaxy. Here is your quasar in the center here. And then look what starts happening. You get a nucleus to the galaxy forming here, an elliptical nucleus, and then you get a spiral arm developing. And what happens is as the process continues, you get the spiral arms actually thinning down and lengthening out and then breaking up into a series of string of pearls arrangements. This is what happens with the filaments. This is what happens with plasma. And we can do this. These are laboratory photographs. And these are the times in seconds that it's taken for these things to form. Okay. So this is the scale of what? A, a laboratory desk? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And you can get these things, uh, these things forming. So what happens is that uh, you can upscale these two cosmic dimensions and you've got a whole range of astronomical phenomena represented in, in these diagrams. So we now have a sequence of events as to how these things formed. Isn't this, isn't this a little bit contradictory? I've heard often that things on a microscopic scale behave under one set of laws and on a cosmic scale behave on a different set of laws. Well, that is true for many things. But for plasma, that is not the case. Plasma is the one thing where we can see a consistent behavior at all scales. Yeah, so you can upscale what we have in the laboratory, what we see out in space. Okay. In the lab, the formation time is minutes. It can be upscaled to the cosmic size of objects up to six billion years. Okay, what we have, the, the quasars form here, roughly 800,000 million years after the initial event of scale. You have the centers of the, you have the elliptical centers of the galaxy roughly one billion years after. You have the formation of the spiral arms complete by about six billion years. Now, wait for the shock. When you apply a change in the speed of light to this scenario, when the speed of light is 6 by 10 to the 11th, in other words, 600 billion times faster, which is what we're getting from the redshift measurements, 
when you apply that correction to these times because these particles are going to be moving that much faster, it turns out that your quasars are forming, your quasars are forming roughly half a day after the creation event. This is where the first light burst out from our galaxy, from the quasar at the centre of our galaxy, and from every other galaxy. And the amazing thing is, because the speed of light was so high, that, that light could get from the centre of our galaxy to where the sun is in 1.5 seconds, the time it takes to get a message to the moon. And then, as you come down, you form the, you form the nucleus of our galaxy in something like one complete day after the creation event, the quasar and the nucleus of the galaxy with its stars. And then you find the spiral arms forming something like four days after the creation event. And our sun is in the spiral arms of our galaxy. And this sun formed on the fourth day. Exactly what our experiments predict when you have a change in the speed of light the whole thing. In other words, you could have a whole universe created in six literal days of 24 hours each. So, if there were an observer, a human-like observer, you're saying it would be happening, it would just appear as if everything was sped up just incredibly. And, and then, so, given an assumption then that the speed of light was so much faster at the beginning and now that it's really dropped down, tapered off very much, wouldn't we expect within our lifetime to also see a slowing of the spinning of galaxies and such? Um, Probably not, um, because the light that we're getting from those galaxies is slowing down, and we're seeing things in slow motion. So any changes that are there are going to be slowed down by the proportion that the speed of light is slow. Okay. Now this is actually advantageous because when we see a supernova explosion in the magnetic clouds, for example, or in a distant galaxy. We're seeing that in slow motion compared to what happened then. But the supernova explosion and its brilliance is governed by the rate of radioactive decay, and radioactive decay was faster. But we're seeing it at the same rate as it happens today, because it's been slowed down in direct proportion. So this is why we see no change out there to what we have today. If we had been there at the spot, yes it would have been, but from our observational point, we see no change. Am I making sense? Yes. Because the light that we would use to observe the slower and the spinning of the galaxy is also slow. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Repeat what he said really loud because he said it really loud. I just said the light that we use to perceive the spinning of the galaxy would be slowing in proportion to the speed of the galaxy slowing. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, yeah, the, so the, the, you believe they would be slowing down. Yes, but our ability to observe that is affected by the fact that the light that's showing us that is also slow. Yeah, very good. Now, so we have, let there be light coming from the center of our galaxy. Let's have a, another, another slide here. Right? Here we show the circumferen circumferential magnetic fields around the plasma filament. Here's the electric fields coming through here. Here's the magnetic fields. What happens is that you can, often you find an instability develops in which the, uh, the plasma gets pinched by the magnetic field. And this sort of break, stretches out and breaks up plasma and concentrates plasma right here. Once this pitch develops, it's self-perpetuating and an instability develops. And this instability gives rise to, I guess, the really vortices in the pitch plasma. You have the instability come, comes as a, a vortex ring like this. And we see the same thing in the aurora borealis. You have, because that's a plasma as well. The, the light that we're getting there is, is in the plasma. But here you see the break up, the, they call it the diocatron, Instability. Uh, this instability is breaking up the, uh, the plasma there. What happens here is this vortex ring 
and you've got this central condensation of plasma here. And, okay, the circumferential vortices detach and the plasma is centrally condensed and this becomes a star because a star effectively is a plasma. And because once the plasma ball is in place, physics can show the gravitational collapse of the star will allow it to light up in just one hour. Not billions of years, one hour. The first stars were formed in the galaxy cores with the plasma hot. The elements were not condensed out, but they were evenly distributed. So after quasars, the first stars formed in the compressed galaxy cores in 1.6, in sorry, in 0.6 to 1 day. So the first stars were formed on the first day. This is the morning stars that Job speaks about. After the galaxy cores were formed, the laboratory experiment showed the spiral arms developed and so on, and we've been through that. So we now have, next line mark, the distribution of the two types of star. There are two types of star that astronomy recognizes. We have the old stars here in the center of the galaxy, or the population of two stars, and you have them in the halo around the galaxy, and the young stars in the spiral arms population one stars like our sun. So you actually have two types of star out in space, the old stars and the young stars. And according to the scriptures, our sun is one of the young stars formed on day four out here in the spiral arms. And so we can account for these. So we can easily recognize the difference between the two populations. Okay, love. Um, the population two stars, the giants there are red and cool, whereas the population one stars, the giants are blue and hot. And this is why there's such a difference in the types of, of colours that you get in the galaxy. The central stars give an orange, yellowy, reddy tint to the, uh, to the centre of the galaxy, like Andromeda here, while the outer stars give blue, uh, a, a predominantly blue colour because they are young. Um, young and population one stars like our sun, the giants there are blue stars. And so the Bible recognizes these two types of uh, star formation, two types of stars, and those like our sun shining on day four, and those uh, that were shining on the first day as Job mentions. So what we have there in Job uh, 38 verses 4 and 7, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand, or who laid its cornerstone. When the morning stars sang together, and all the angels of God shouted for joy. Or, in the Septuagint version, Who is he that made the keystone upon it? When the first stars were made, and all my angels praised me with a loud voice. So here we have two types of stars being formed from the Bible, in exact agreement with astronomy. So we have a twofold astronomical truth presented in two different verses of the scripture. So let's have a quick look at the ages of the two stellar populations, don't we? And to start raising our time on the hours. That's okay. We still have to get to the important <laughs> Okay, the radiometric ages of stars. We talk about how radioactive decay is faster when the speed of light is high. The population two stars, uranium thorium dating, had 12.5 plus or minus 1.5 billion atomic years as the best age for the population two stars by all methods, giving an average age of around about 13.7 billion atomic years. Again, this is radiometrically atomic years, this is not orbital years. Okay? Population one, by the thorium near billion ratio, is 5.2 to 11.2 billion atomic years. The best age for population one by all methods is about 8.2 billion atomic years. The atomic age difference, population two minus population one, is 5.5 billion atomic years. Right. I'll go to short circuit some of this. Let's. Uh, Move on to the next uh, Genesis, the next slide, Mark, the Genesis Ages of Stars. I'll come back to one thing I was saying in just a moment. 
And the observation of stars, the population is two stars. The early stars, the morning stars were shining on day, halfway through day one, so about 0.6 of a day. The population one stars were shining day 3.9, fourth day. Genesis age difference is 3.3 days. The light speed conversion to atomic time, here we come. 6 by 10 to the 11th times faster times 3.3 days equals 5.4 billion atomic years. This is the exact age difference that we're getting between the two populations of stars. We can account for that simply by a 3.3 age, 3.3 uh, days age. Yeah, thanks. This is by a 3.3 days difference in the formation time. Now, how does this work? The aging of stars depends on the reaction rates in the cores, which were slight speed dependent. Um, now, if they were burning rapidly, they would age quickly. But what about a star's luminosity? You can show that a star's light and heat output is independent of the speed of light because the opacity, the opaqueness of a star, traps the light in. So that no matter where it was during after immediately after creation week, the light output from the star was uh, confusing me there, my life. Okay. The light output from the star is exactly the same as what we have today. So there's not going to be any difference. What is happening, however, is that the star is being pumped up with light during creation week. So what is happening? We find that uh, as this pumping up continues, what about pressure and temperature balance? Harvard and Hoyle pointed out that any appreciable deviation from pressure equilibrium leads to a stellar readjustment that takes no more than about one hour. In other words, you can get stability within one hour in the sun immediately after it's been formed. Harvard shows that the temperature stabilizes in less than one month. This is amazing. So if you go to our next slide, though, Stars slide 14. The stars were actually primed during creation week. The opacity, the opaqueness, traps the star's radiation in. A small amount escapes, equivalent to what we have today. Now, we find that <coughs> the core is 90% of the star's mass. This is where the burning occurs. Here we have again a core of 90% of the star's mass. If you have burning on day four, compare the two burnings, what's happening here. This is burning on the first day, compared to burning on the fourth day. The burning has produced a amount of light which is pushing out the star's atmosphere. So you have this one, but after three and a half days extra burning from day one, you have an immense amount more of light pushing up the atmosphere here, so you have your huge extended red giants. This is how your red giants are turn out on day one compared to the blue stars of day four. It all makes perfect sense. Well, okay. Joe also mentioned about the singing of stars. We haven't time to go into that at the moment. Can we just skip the next slide, love, and move on to the slide? It's good? Okay, let's do it. Joe mentioned the singing of stars. When the morning stars sang together, gases boil up onto the surface and stars form in these sort of patterns. They call them granules. These granules are about 800 kilometers across. Boyle and Sports Child suggested that the sound wave, that sound waves are generated by these moving gases, so that granules make a noise. Though the star is actually singing. Hmm. When the morning stars sang together. Now interestingly also that word singing can mean stridulating, vibrating or pulsing. And you'd also get a pulsing as this pressure balance came to, uh, to stabilise. And so this temperature balance being achieved on day one, the stars may in fact be pulsating. So there are the two possible explanations for the stars pulsating or singing are absolutely correct. So whichever way you look at the scripture, you're getting a true result of it. So the Bible is absolutely correct. So let's now turn our attention to planets and begin with their formation process. You start with a dusty plasma. By this time, temperature is starting to drop in your plasma. 
you have dust forming there, and uh, our population one star like our sun formed from a cool dust of dusty plasma. The magnetic pinch concentrated the plasma and dust, and as the pinch increased, you had this magnetic instability forming, um, which formed vortices in a ring around the plasma. Originally, you had the plasma, the instability developed, gave this vortex ring. You still had your central plasma here, which as the pinch continued, again gave another vortex ring, and the pinch continued, you got another vortex ring with a star in the center. And you see how the planets are forming, because what happens here in these vortices is that one vortex in particular will take over control of the whole ring and form your planet. And you get your star forming as the last thing forming in your planet formation process. This is why the Earth was there before the Sun. The Bible had it. So the process repeats and you end up with a concentric series of rings of, of vortices and a central plasma ball. Now, there's something else about plasma. It turns out, as they do their research work, and it's actually here in Here's the article on which all of this is based from the IEEE Transactions of Plasma Science, Volume P DS14, number six on December 1986. I should have covered with this years ago, but here's our here's our diagrams all in uh, all in here in this paper. In a uh, here's the one with the uh, double radio galaxy, and then over here we should have. Uh, um, all lots of calculations and so on. Uh, but uh, the slide that I showed you actually came from here. Yeah, there we are. There's the series of uh, objects which are formed as a result. They point out, they point out in that paper that the plasma, the current in the plasma actually starts concentrating the elements out of the dust. The innermost layer of elements are iron, silicon, and magnesium. Then there's carbon and sulfur. And then there's a middle layer with hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And an outermost layer of helium. Hey, this is the exact sequence of elements that we have in the makeup of our planets. Both our Earth and with the gaseous giants. It all works. And the elements are separated preferentially by the positive charge on the by the uh, charge on the ions and the plasma temperature. So the basic structure of all the planets with their iron cores, and we know that all the planets have iron cores out to uh, out to Uranus, and the silicate mantle and water and a nitrogen atmosphere, and then for the outer planets, the the, the helium and hydrogen are still being maintained. It, it, it's all there. Yeah, I've seen that, that shape before, the, the vortices. Uh, that's in, you can find that in the Mandelbrot's that okay. yeah. drill down into it. Yeah. So it's, it's mathematically simple. It is. To, to, to get to that. Yeah. What was the volume number again of that paper? IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science, Volume PS. 14, that's one four, number six, December 1986, starting page 763. Evolution of the plasma universe, the formation of systems of galaxies. By Anthony L. Perat, P E R A T T, senior member of the IEEE. So presumably that was done within a Big Bang Framework? Big Bang Framework? Yeah. You have that on your website? You can actually pick it up on Anthony Perak's website. Okay. It would be very if we put it Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can ask him. It's more late. So, okay. The creation is asking him. <laughs> and notice what happens in the vortex, in the vort in vortices. Here's the behavior of gas and dust in the turbulent eddy after the long device act. Um, you have, as the vortex goes around, you have dust, 
thrust drifting into the center and gas being thrown out towards the edge. You can do a little experiment back home. If you get ooh, a glass, reasonable sized glass with parallel sides, a, a cylindrical glass, put some water in there and put in the water a big spoonful of sugar, reasonable sized glass, stir it up, pull the spoon out and watch what happens to the sugar. It works better with jello, it's jello's colour. Yeah. It turns out that as the system starts slowing down, the sugar and the jello start moving towards the centre. You get you get all of these things. This is exactly what's happening. And, and you can also get spiral arms forming as well. This is this is we did this at with some school kids on one on one occasion. We had a big phone and all the kids stood around, put the jello in, we put the water in, stirred it up and said, okay, now watch what happens. And the kids' eyes pop and said, cool. <laughs> okay. So it can happen quickly. It doesn't, this process doesn't take millions of years. It happens in seconds. So this is how the God how God formed the planets in seconds. So, okay. Now Okay, um, let's look at some astronomical consequences in the solar system. We need to know where the radioactive elements were originally in the planetary bodies. What I need to do is give you a little bit further information first. When the speed of light was higher, radioactive decay was faster. But you can show that because the properties of space were different, that the energy density of the radiation back then, when it was fast, when it was decaying, when radioactive decay was happening more quickly, the energy density of the radiation was no greater then than it is now. So it means that radioactive decay was not, not even though it was faster, was no more dangerous then than it is now. Now this is a development which Russ Humphreys and some of the others haven't put up, um, but bless him, uh, he's doing a lot of good work there. But this is one thing that this model allows, which uh, their model doesn't. And as a consequence, you can show that something's happening with the stars, the, the light from the stars, even though uh, the reaction was occurring more quickly, the, the, the light that we're actually getting from the stars is no more... Um, uh, no more luminous than what they are today. So, we need to know where the radioactive elements were originally in planetary bodies. And for the Earth, the 1999 data assessment showed that there was a reservoir of heat producing radioactive elements in the bottom 1,000 kilometres of the mantle, which came to the surface by geological processes. This is standard geology now. It's accepted by the geologists that there was this layer of radioactive material way, way, way below the surface of the Earth from about the th bottom 1,000 kilometres of the mantle. And you had uh, potassium being concentrated in the core. It then became, then was brought to the surface as a result of ongoing geological processes. Noah's flood, for example, was a major factor in this when the fountains of the Great Deep burst out. And radioactive material came also to the, uh, to the surface at the time of the paleocontinental division in a similar situation with the other in the planets. In the initial conditions in Genesis 1, the Earth was cool at first with water on the surface and the heating came later in a similar situation with other inner planets. And this is where the Bible is in disagreement with the current astronomical thinking. Current astronomical thinking think, starts with everything being very hot and molten and cooling down. The Bible says no, it started cool and heated up. And when you do that, a whole different scenario opens up which explains what we see on the other planets and on the moon. And this is very important for our modeling. It's heated up internally because of rapid radioactive decay of the short half-life elements. Calculation shows that the majority of the heating of the Earth would have occurred in the period of the first 3,500 years, basically from the period of creation to Abraham. And a maximum temperature obtained would be about 5,800 degrees, which is similar to what we have in the core today. You can do your calculations on this already. 
before you read the details. Now, a similar, a similar situation exists for the other inner planets. Radioactive, rapid radioactive heating of the planetary interiors. They started off cold and radioactive heating occurred. We need one additional factor in this. When we look at the meteorites that we have coming in from outer space, we find that the ones which are typical of what the Earth was made up of contain minerals which had up to 10% of water in them. Rapid radioactive heating of the interior then occurred due to the radioactive decay. The interior begins to expand because of the heat. Pressure builds up as water is driven out of the rocks in the interior. Okay, as the, the rocks heat up, water is driven off from the minerals. Okay, in Genesis 2, we're told that a mist, or in the Septuagint version, fountains sprang up from the interior of the earth, from, from the surface of the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. Yeah, yeah. And this is why, because the radioactive heating of the interior was driving up the water out of these rocks and it was expressing itself on the surface. The pressure drives the water out of the rocks and then eventually it builds up and builds up and builds up under the, under the crust until eventually there's an explosive release of the water. And then after that, the interior still keeps heating and forms magma there, and there is volcanism. And then the interior continues to heat and becomes molten. And as the interior becomes molten, the surface cracks and expands to the windward body of the molten rock. And then you have surface flooding and magma. Now, just one point in there. You find that the as a rock changes from rock to magma, just at the point where it becomes from solid, goes from solid to liquid, there's an actual increase of 10% in its volume. You can imagine what happens at this point here. We'll come to that in just a minute. Okay. So, so yeah, I just got hung up on something already. When we talk about the original state being this plasma, rapidly expanded, electricity added to it, vibration, generating filaments, filaments condensing, producing these bodies, these heavenly bodies. But wouldn't that be a hot condition? It's cooling very rapidly. It was hot, but it was cooling. It was cooling very rapidly. As the expansion continued, this gave rapid, very rapid cooling. So it cooled quickly, but while it's cooling, thermally, you also got this radioactive. Yeah, okay, so what, what is happening is that once the planet has formed, the surface of the planet has formed, the whole planet's in place, the radioactive heating deep down in the interior is starting to, mm. to go. You have this percentage, you have this ten percent of water in the minerals making up the rocks down there. The water is driven out. Okay. Now, even today, okay. There's a type of meteorite, as I've mentioned, water is locked under these minerals. Now, for example, the mineral serpentine. When you heat serpentine, it's up to 13% water in its body. As you heat serpentine, it gives off its water and becomes olivine. And olivine is the major component of our magnet. So two key factors emerge. The high water content, the planetary interiors and rapid radioactive decay and put together with the effects of radioactive heating in planetary interiors they expand, they crack, they burst depending on the, the water content. And so you have this idealized system of things here. So there are the three phases of Mars. Yes? If I could jump there really fast. Yeah, please. This is known as blood. This is the Tower of Babel. <laughs> This is the time of Pele. Time of Pele. Yeah, we might as well do this bit. We'll, we'll be doing it next time, but that's jumping ahead because I think he has this slide still for the next week. Oh, I don't have to slide that, that basically gives you the sequence of events that we have biblically. And so we have the three phases of Mars. 
how many times have we been together and Sharon comes on and then of course we're like our captain's head. A lot of neat things. First of all, phase one, you have the initial impacts from cometary bodies from the outer solar system. We haven't time to go into how this happened, but there was a, a breakup of uh, a cometary body, a uh, large cometary body in the outer solar system beyond Pluto in the uh, Kuiper Belt, and radioactive heating. So then we had expansion, okay, fractures, here, and up here, sorry, these are the fractures, and the upper lift along here, which demarcated the uh, northern plains from the south, southern terrain. You had erosion at the same time as that expansion, because water was associated with it, this expansion. Water was associated with this event here. In fact, one science journal mentioned that you had one third of the volume of the Indian Ocean outpoured on the surface of Mars in, yes, I've got it right, in just eight weeks. That is the flood on Mars, the equivalent of the flood on Mars, yes. There was water on Mars. What's happened? Well, as time has gone on, you've had interior heating up becoming molten, and the magma is being outpoured on the surface through these cracks. And what happens is that as this magma is outpoured, and the surface sinks down uh, into a uh, into this, uh, liquid mantle, you have you have the water which was there being evaporated and absorbed into the mineral grains which now make up this part of the, of the planet. And this is why the planet is so red. It's literally a world that's rusted away. The water has been absorbed by the mineral grains which now appear on the surface there. So the, so the heating continued, more water's out, poured later and go to red with the fossils. We have two phases of the moon. First, there was the initial impacts from cometary bodies from the outer solar system, uh, which gave immense fault lines, like here around the Mara Imperial Basin. Uh, here's where these great big impacts occurred. And um, all these fault lines, then what happened as the uh, interior of the moon became molten, along these cracks here, that whole block no, sank down into the liquid magma and displaced the magma and it was out poured across the surface in a series of events. Uh, this happened in, uh, uh, in several phases. So the heating continued, the lunar mantle be became fluid and the blocks of the crust drop along the fault lines and the magma from the interior of the mare. So this is how you account for that, uh, uh, that thing on the moon. Now on the asteroid belt, astronomers talk about a common parent body for the asteroids. You had, a, you had an asteroid planet and its moon. And you had the same process happening on this body. The concept is supported because 16% of the near-Earth Earth asteroids are doubled. It's showing explosion signatures. So this planet actually broke up as a result of this process, this heating process in the interior of the asteroids, uh, in the interior of the asteroid on the planet, on its moon. And as a consequence of this, we know that uh, we know, in fact, that uh, uh, aluminium 26 and magnesium 26 are, are, are there on the asteroids. You, you had sufficient radioactive heating to do this, and uh, we have a different. The, the asteroids come, comprise three different sorts of material. First of all, is the material which is like the centre of the asteroid, which is uh, uh, iron and nickel and so on. Then you have. Uh, a, something like the mantle, and then we have something which is equivalent to uh, the uh, the asteroid's moon. And there is a three-phase, bro uh, two-fold breakup of the asteroid planet. There is its uh, surface, and then its interior, and then there was the moon itself broke up. And this gave rise to three major impact events right across the solar system. We can see these impacts on the uh, on the surface of uh, of the other planets and moons. So. The interesting thing is the heating gave, uh, radio gave water acting on the parent body two billion atomic years ago and reset some radioactive clocks. The breakup, the twofold breakup of the parent body occurred 700 million atomic years ago and 225 million atomic years ago, and on its moon 70 million atomic years ago. Each of these dates is within five million atomic years before a major catastrophe geologically on Earth.
And these geological catastrophes relate to catastrophes in Genesis 1 to 11, as we'll see in the next session. And the 500 million years. Okay, let me just give you this. Geologic, when you do your spin life correction to the billions of atomic years, Noah's flood occurred 700 million atomic years ago, or something like 3,500 BC. You find the Babel incident, the Babel crisis, corresponds with the Permian extinction 250 million atomic years ago. And you find that the breakup of the continents in the days of Peleg occurred 75 and occurred 65 million atomic years ago, but around about 3025 BC. So you actually come down to a series of events in which you can place geological data in with a biblical time frame. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next session. Okay, I'm going to start this because Barry's voice is getting really tired. Um, but I only do a little bit, then you get him mostly. But this is where, in this one, we deal with the geology, and this is where um, people are very nervous, some of the, the people who are organizing this, because this is where we argue with ICR and AIG and dispute what they say about the blood and what it did in the fossil record. Let me tell you just a tiny bit of how Barry arrived at this. In 1979, he was given a book on astronomical anomalies, and at the back of it, it had a short chart of how the speed of light had changed, the measurements over about 300 years. And he looked at it and said, well, that's strange. I'd always been taught it was the same. So he figured he'd just wrap up this little problem on observational error in a couple of weeks. This is 27 years later. Um, what happened was, it was like looking, it was like finding a child and not realizing he had brothers and sisters. And then finding out that they were brothers and sisters and that they all had the same parent. The speed of light was not the cause of a lot of what he has been telling you. It's one of the children of the cause of the ZPE. So he started at it by looking at one of the kids and then it found out that this went into this whole area that he had never ever expected. When Barry started out, he was an old earth um, theistic evolutionist, essentially. And it was the data, and, and not the Bible, it was the data that brought him down to a very young creation. And there was no way to escape what the data was telling him. He's the only one I ever worked with who went data first. And I think that's why his work holds together so well. What we'll be dealing with this time is the geology of earth itself. And in particular, Noah's Flood and the two disasters that followed after. Noah's Flood gets the most press because it was God's judgment on the human race. And the Bible is a story of God's relationship with the human race. And that's its main focus. Its main focus is not to tell us about geological events. Its main focus is not to tell us about the history of all the other cultures in the world. Its main purpose is to tell us God's relationship with the human race, what happened to us, the formation of the Jewish people through whom he would show himself in his law, bring forth his Redeemer, and then how it expanded to the Gentiles and how we're all involved. That does not tell us how the Grand Canyon was formed. That does not tell us about the trenches of Mariana. That does not tell us all kinds of things that maybe we would want to know in other fields. So we can't expect the Bible to be a science textbook, but it is a science guidebook. And if we stay within the parameters that the Bible sets for us, we're going to find the truth. As soon as we wander outside those parameters, we're liable to be deceived in any number of ways. So staying within the parameters of the Bible, however, we find that there's still a tremendous amount of discovery that can go on and a tremendous amount of science that can be done, all searching for the truth. What Henry Morris did was absolutely incredible when he opened up the field of creation science again with Genesis record. And there is no way either of us would ever disparage that incredible man's work. What he did do, however, was introduce the idea that one flood was responsible for the majority of the geologic column. 
and what geology and even the Bible ends up indicating is that it may not be true. And that's going to be the thrust of this lecture. Yes, the flood happened. Yes, it was a total worldwide flood. No arguing about that. When those fountains of the deep burst forth with all of that water that was trapped under the Earth's crust, it came up with gigantic force. It inundated the Earth. It destroyed all life. The Bible is absolutely correct. However, the flood layer is not where we think it is. Um, Barry's work is shown, and this is on the net, and we don't, he doesn't really go into it here, that the flood layer is actually below the Cambrian level, and that the fossilization came after the flood. And it came in areas that were still geologically active. For instance, right after the flood, we have a marshy, nasty world to live in. It didn't dry out and get gorgeous right away. There, was, there would have been tons of marshy areas all around with a few high-rise places where you could walk. When we look at the fossils, what we find is they're not evenly distributed across the whole world, but they're concentrated in areas that were geologically active, usually at the edges of the geologically active, active areas. So when you have the flood and you have these fountains of the deep bursting forth, they burst forth through areas that were probably the incipient cracks or the cracks where the incipient plate boundaries would be later when everything split apart. So it wasn't an even distribution of these massive fountainous bursting forth. It would be lines of them. And it's along these lines where you get subsidence. And in the subsidence you get marshy areas after the flood where water's drained down. In this marshy area, what's going to live? Your mosses, your ferns, your algae, your insects. These are also geologically active areas. So what's going to be happening? Mudslides and all kinds of things as everything settles. So what's going to be buried first are these animals. Above the marine layer, you'll have these animals buried. And so it goes on. And very well, we'll give you more of this. But we seriously do not think the flood fossilized almost anything. It was hot, scalding water. It was incredible force. It would have torn it apart. We have approximately two miles deep, below the Cambrian level, of carbon-rich sediment. We think that was probably the flood layer. It's rotted, massively rotted amounts of something that was alive, two miles thick. It's all over the world, wherever it wasn't divided by the continents or washed out or washed over something but it's universal. Um, do you want to, are you doing okay now? Do you want to come up and finish this? <laughs> the perception is, has often been that the flood was waters coming down, not necessarily coming up. It would have come up first. Genesis 7:11 says that the great fountains of the deep burst forth. The word burst in Hebrew is a very violent verb. Um, it follows up with the idea of the heated water under the surface having cooled and reached a critical point because it says all the fountains burst forth at the same time. This would have gone up higher than the geysers of volcanoes today with this kind of force. Now, whether there was some kind of vapor canopy or not, I don't know, but I do know that that stuff would have gone up, condensed, well, up it's come down. and come down <laughs> in this massive, horrific, not just water vein, but you have all this pulverized debris that goes up with it, would have come down as a scalding, solid-type rain almost with all of this junk all over the place. The other thing, and this was as in my studies in biology and genetics, something occurred to me. This is our first exposure, mankind's first exposure, these eight people that are left alive on the ark to radioactive material. If you look in the Bible, age limits drop one by 50% immediately after the ark. Was there some kind of genetic damage from being exposed to that radioactive material? The clue here may also be that at the time of Peleg, we see another 50% drop from approximately 400 years to approximately 200. That's within one generation. It's not a gradual decline until after that. The time of Peleg continents split, you also have an upwelling of material. Was this another? massive event that affected the remaining humans on Earth. Just an idea, not doctrine, and I'll give this over to my husband. Wow. Thanks for the time. Really very well. I was tempted to let you finish the lecture on this one. Okay. Now, so, as Penny mentioned, there seems to be geological evidence that indicates that just one flood did not do everything. I remember talking to my old lecturer in geology, 
Brian, who has become Dean of the Faculty of Science at Adelaide University, and I'll put up with him again. And I have shared with him some of my research work on the changing speed of light, changing speed of light and so on. And uh, as I did this, he looked at the graphs, he said, well, those graphs are very impressive. Um, he said, uh, what does this have to do with the geological column? And I shared with him, that, okay, the time scale is going to be much shorter. And he rang me a week or so later. He said, Barry, he said, I've rung you to let you know I've come to accept the Genesis record of creation as being correct. But he said, the flood just can't account for the whole geological column. It can't have happened in just one year. Can't you give us more time? Can't you give us more time? <laughs> this guy had just become a Christian. He'd become to, come to the stage where he was accepting what God was saying was true, and yet he was the whole creationist movement saying, well, virtually the whole movement saying, hey, it all happened in one year. Brian Gay spent a quarter of an hour giving example after example after example how it couldn't have happened. Let's try the next slide, do For example, there's an inside you remains of a sponge, a fossil sponge reef, which stretches 2,900 kilometres across Europe. It goes from Spain, across to Romania, and up to Germany. The sponges are upright. There is this fossil reef, they are upright uh, in size, and we have the cone shaped uh, uh, like this. They have the, their spicules coming down here. They have the they have everything pointing to the fact that they are in place, not washed in. If they were washed in, they would be upside down. So, okay, they, it took many years for this sponge layer to form. It sits on earlier strata, which itself is fossiliferous. There is a coal measure below this. So you have a coal measure, you have the sponge reef, and then on top of the sponge reef, you have layer upon annual layer of dinosaur nests. You can't have this all happening in one year. It doesn't work. You have to look at something else. And we have an alternative here today. Let's have a look at some stromatolites. There are other evidence. There are growth of stromatolites, which are algal mats. You see those here in Chart Bay in Western Australia. These mounds take time to form. They're scattered throughout the geological column, even in one locality. They take time to form. What happens is that these uh, algal mats are there. As the tide washes in with a new layer of sand and debris, the algal mat absorbs this, grows up over it, gets older. That's important to realize too. Is that the base of them is more narrow than the top. So if they're buried in situ, you're going to see them with a narrow base and a fat top. Whereas if they've been washed in, you're going to see them tumbled and some fat tops down and narrow bases up and that kind of thing. Okay. They're found in situ like that in the fossil record. And these are living? These are, these are living? These are living these ones here. Oh, okay. yeah. Here in Australia, you can still see mm -hmm. different. Not the fossilized, but... These look like rocks here, but they're, they're yeah, a, that's, a creature. Those are so that's, they're actually like albumats, yeah. So, you see, there's a conceptual problem. These things take time to form. We find them in a fossil record, various layers, um, even in one locality. And so this talks about a, an ecological zone, a, a period of time in which these have had to build up. So there's a conceptual problem there. So this is why one catastrophe, one year model, is not really satisfactorily satisfactory geologically. Imagine for a moment the concept from Genesis 7-11, where the fountains of the Great Deep burst out. Dr. Walter T. Brown... He didn't what? have telephone lines. <laughs> yeah. That's the most massive underwater explosion that's been man-made. That gives you some sort of impression there. Dr. Walt Brown pointed out that the explosive eruption of water from the Earth's interior would be something like 10,000 times that of Krakatoa at any one point in this crack. The Earth's surface was uh, hardly stable and calm after just one year of this sort of activity. You wouldn't expect uh, 
Realistically, you'd expect continuing activity with massive tremors, crustal settling, and the Bible hints at some of this sort of thing. In Psalm 18, verses 7 to 15, you find massive volcanism and earthquakes and the foundations of the earth disclosed. And we only get hints at other, dis uh, at other catastrophes because the main purpose is the relationship between God and man. So, okay. So, um, we find that uh, the distribution of predominant life forms and rock types form a problem for a one year, uh, one flood did everything model. So expect a fossil mix of all types of uh, flora and fauna in the same strata if in fact everything came from one flood. Instead, okay, well, what we find is the, among the plants for example, we find in the lowest layers we find the spore bearing plants. And then another layer further up in the geological column we find the gymnosperms, the, uh, uh, the palms and the pines. And then higher up again we find the angiosperms. And evolutionists say, well this is a this is a, an evolutionary sequence. We have to account for this. How how is this how is this working? This distribution is characteristic worldwide and it's the same for animals and it's the same for rock types. We've got to face this data. We just can't sweep it under the carpet and say, well, uh, we've got another explanation for it. We think it all happened at one time. It doesn't quite work like that. You have to face the facts. So we have problems for the traditional uh, creationist model. Um, for example, you would expect uh, the middle group uh, in many localities would contain a vast array of different fossil and rock types instead. We find the middle group contains mainly this sort of plant. Why is that the case? It's often been suggested, okay, sweetie, the uh, ecological zoning. But this distribution can be explained by ecological zones. You start off with the water sweep in from the flood, you have your sea creatures here, and then you go up with your amphibians and reptiles up to man. But this is not really a vertical sequence. This is more of a horizontal sequence as we're going inland. It's certainly climbing somewhat, but it doesn't actually give you a satisfactory explanation. There's something missing from there. And it's often been suggested that this uh, can be uh, explained by uh, hydrodynamic sorting and graded bedding, where you get small regular at the bottom and large irregular at the top. Uh, but the problem is that the largest fauna, the dinosaurs, are in the middle layers, not at the top. And uh, so we could go on. Um, the fossil record is also a problem to the evolutionists because you have the uh, you have abrupt appearance of various flora and fauna which persist unchanged right through to the present, unless they become <coughs> extinct. And this gives a lie to evolution. For example, this is one of the first fossil jellyfish found in the geological record. It's found there in South Australia. I'm familiar with it. It and had to fossilize quickly. And if it was under scalding waters and a lot of debris, it would not have remained that acute and sweet and perfect. It had to fossilize quickly, but it couldn't have been under hot scalding waters. And he pointed out. Interestingly, just near that is also a fossil of a Portuguese man of war, which we still have today. We recognize them today. So, okay, this is, uh, this is very interesting. So, this fossil dates as being 600 million atomic years ago. That translates to something, according to the speed of light correction, something just after the flood. Again, we have the first fossil spider in the fossil record, dating about 300 million atomic years ago. Very little different from the spiders we have today. This one's not showing up so clearly, but this uh, the spider actually had uh, um, spinnerets capable of spinning thread. It had tarsal claws for weaving webs, the same as the web weaving spiders today. There's no sign of a transitional form in there. There's no change over a period of 300 million atomic years. That actually dates to something like um, just before the, uh, the Babel crisis. So, okay, the next, uh, next slide, love. Another example is the cowrie pine. And uh, this is on the 
recovered the beautiful book, The Greening of Gondwana by Mary White. Here's a fossil cowrie pine in the background here. And here is a living cowrie pine on the cover. Front cover read, a fossil cowrie pine is a specimen from the Trabalga fish beds with a twig of a living cowrie pine. Little change after 175 million years. That's atomic years, of course. Fascinating. Okay, so evolutionists have got a problem. So in all this, let's face the fact that creationists have got a problem, evolutionists have got a problem. Probably neither of us have got the full truth in this case. You have an anomaly, a lot of anomalies actually, working with this data. Are you going to throw out your theories and accept what the data says, or are you going to throw out the data and just say the theory is correct? So in all of this, okay, so we the next one. In all of this, we must seek the encouragement from the Lord and keep searching. Because Amos 9, 6, in one version of the scripture said, the New King James said, it is the Lord who built his hierarchy in the heavens, the system of galaxies, and founded his strata upon the earth, the geological column. The Lord is his name. This indicates that the evidence from astronomy and geology will accord with God's revelation in the Bible. The Bible gives us clues, and we look again at the Bible and the geological column and see what solution exists. Let's have a look at the main areas of the geological column. These main areas were determined over 200 years ago, before Lyell, before Darwin, before radiometric dating, before atomic clocks. What they did was to trace the strata over a large region and they found that there were basically four, well, mainly three actually, here yeah, because they could get down to the fourth, so they so in certain places on earth you pick up this four. But they made these three eras, the Paleozoic life, meaning early and meaning ancient life, middle life and recent life. There were these three eras, we had three characteristic types of fossils, in plants and animals, and you had three characteristic types of rock. Each rock type in here was different from what you had in either of the others. So you had these three main eras separated by two catastrophes. And as it turns out, the most recent work that we have, there is a fourth era down here with another catastrophe. So OK, let's have a look at this in some detail. Can we have the next slide? I'm going to go through, <coughs> rather without the notice from this point on, hopefully. So what we have geologically, we have the Archaeozoic era, the ancient life era, with a catastrophe here, around about 720 million atomic years ago. Some of the dates here are, have been changed a little bit as a result of recent work. 720 million atomic years ago, there was this strata, this layer in here, which represented the crisis. It was called Snowball Earth. You may hear about it in the, um, in the press about the Snowball Earth. What we have here is a layer of about 300 metres of rock and debris in a cement-like matrix. I have some from, I came from where I come from in South Australia. This matrix contains rock that have been washed in from over 500 miles away. A, a geologists look at this and say, hey, the only way we know of this happening is for it to be transported by ice and dumped. And so they call it a tillite or a diamectite because this is how ice does things and forms this sort of rock. Problem. The matrix in which these fragments are found can only be formed in hot water. <laughs> Doesn't work with ice. They have a problem. And then on top of that layer, you have two and a half kilometers of carbon rich sediments, which when you examine the carbon, contains kerogen, which is the breakdown from muscles. Turns out when you do the speed of light correction, geological, to the uh, um, 
atomic clock time here of 720 million atomic years, it turns out that that corresponds with Noah's flood. Here's the period from creation to the flood. Geologically, the next strata is the Paleozoic era, the old, uh, the, uh, the early life era. What you have in here is um, the, um, the algae, the mosses, the ferns, the insects, and the amphibians. They're predominant in there. And then you have this layer here where a catastrophe occurred. 251 million atomic years ago. The Permian extinction, it was called. When you correct this date, turns out that corresponds to the Babel catastrophe that we have in the Bible. And then up here, you have following the Permian extinction, you have the Mesozoic, middle life era, in which the temperatures were, because of what happened here, you have massive volcanic outpouring at this time. Uh, at the time of the permanent extinction. The carbon dioxide that went into the atmosphere bumped up the, uh, uh, the greenhouse effect. Temperatures were about 10 degrees Celsius above what it was down here. And you had a complete change in atmospher uh, atmospheric conditions. And as a consequence, you had a different fossil type phase, a, a different uh, uh, animal type phase. And then you had the Cretaceous tertiary extinction at this point here, which corresponds to uh, 65 million atomic years, which corresponds to the days of Peleg. In the days of Peleg, the Earth was divided. The continents were divided there. And then following that, you had, very shortly after, the onset of an ice age. And the ice age divided the Cenozoic or recent life era. That corresponded, the ice age corresponded to the time of Job. Let's have a look at some things in more detail. Yeah, let's pop that one in the car. Let me remind you that the basis of what I'm doing here is following this curve, which we've determined as being the, the way that the uh, zero point energy has behaved with time. We're using this curve, we're going back along this curve by uh, using a process uh, in calculus called integration, finding out when these various atomic ages occurred on in orbital time. Okay. Next one, Mark. Here is so what we have here in the geological column. Geologically, there are four eras separated by three catastrophes. You have the Archaeozoic, Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic. With three catastrophes, the Snowball Earth, the... Uh, uh, the, the Permian extinction and the Cretaceous tertiary extinction. Wipe out of the dinosaurs. Biblically, what we have in Genesis 1 to 11 are also three, four eras followed with, separated by three catastrophes. From the falls of the flood with the flood crisis, flood to Babel with the Babel crisis, Babel to Peleg when the earth, the continents were divided that uh, crisis there, and then time from Peleg up to Job. And what surprised me, what, what amazed me, was that when you put the speed of light correction or the zero point energy correction in there, it turns out that these four eras and these three catastrophes in each correspond like that. They fit together like a hand in a glove. And here it is. Fall of the flood geologically, the Archaeozoic era, 2,250 uh, 2, orbital calendar years into the catastrophe one Noah's flood, Snowball Earth, 720 million atomic years ago. Flood to Babel, geologically, the Paleozoic era, 370 orbital years in actual fact, ends with catastrophe two, the Tower of Babel incident, the Permian extinction, 251 million atomic years ago. Babel to Peleg, geologically, the Mesozoic era. Into the catastrophe three, the time of Peleg, Cretaceous tertiary extinction, and Peleg to Abraham, the Cenozoic era, which includes Job's Ice Age. Well, okay. Um, this is rather astounding stuff. It only dawned on me, it was only a matter of about a year and a half ago, 
that these four eras and three catastrophes were fitting together like this when I started putting the data together. Okay, this one. Okay. Well, no, that's okay. What we will do now is look at these eras and the catastrophes and see how they work out biblically, what was happening biblically and geologically. Because geologically we have the strata telling us what was going on there. Biblically we know what was happening with the human race. Let's put the story together. The first thing that happens is the snowball earth catastrophe at the time of Noah's flood. What was happening? The interior of the earth was heating up as a result of radioactive decay, as I mentioned uh, in our previous session. The water that was associated with the minerals in the rocks was being driven out towards the surface. It then burst out onto the surface as this massive uh, outpouring of water. Uh, roughly half the volume of the present oceans was outpoured at that time. Originally, we're told in Genesis that uh, God separated the uh, the continent from the from the land from the uh, the land from the, the seas. So you had one original land that's the, a supercontinent, and the rest of the the uh, com uh, rest of the uh, earth was just ocean. But then, with the flood, you had that the volume of the ocean was uh, approximately doubled. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the rock that we have there, the rock strata. Snowball Earth, the geologists had a real problem. You have this, um, you have this matrix, which is a warm water thing, and yet you have this diamectite, th these rocks of cobbles, pebbles, boulders, all mixed up in a in a, in a higgledy piggledy mass. Some from local, some from hundreds of miles away, all churned together in this one uh, one matrix. And geologists can't account for this. They look at the Snowball Earth, and they have to have to say, okay, there are, there are massive there's massive volcanism, and we had uh, the volcanism rose, raised the temperatures up tremendously, and then we had this massive cooling down again, and they have all sorts of hassles in trying to explain it. The flood explains how you got those rocks from 500 miles away to, uh, to a local source without any difficulty. So the flood explains uh, the, the diamectite. It also explains the three and a, two and a half kilometers thick uh, carbon-rich sediments, which, uh, which follow afterwards. Okay. What was happening prior to the flood, there were areas in which underneath, well underneath the surface, uh, granites, had, uh, granites had intruded and formed what were called cratons or stable areas. And these had a thick layer of sediments on top of them. What happened at the time of the floods? Uh, the flood was that the sediments were washed off the cratons, these cratons, into the downward stippled areas here, and this is where the this is where all the flood sediment can be found. And these areas were then standing high. You have, for example, the West Australian Shield area that was standing high after the flood. These cratons were standing high after the flood, but these other areas were downward and probably covered with a lot of water. Okay, what you have is a situation in which you have had warm water and many of the uh, um, legends and many of the traditions of the flood was that the waters outpoured at the time of the flood were hot and this is why they came up from the interior of the earth. So you have warm water, large bodies of warm water after the flood which are going to favour the algae, the mosses, the ferns and the insects and the amphibians, because the insects probably survived in large numbers on floating vegetation mass. So these got off to a massive start. So this is the sort of life which would be predominant in those lower lying areas where you had a large, large bodies of, uh, of warm water. These were also the geologically active areas, as, as Penny pointed out. And then, next slide, love. That, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, which way? Let's just rotate it around. Yeah. That does well. Yeah. Okay. Then you had the Permian extinction. What happened was that the interior of the Earth was continuing to heat from the radioactive decay there. As this heating continued, you had 
pools of magma forming and you had areas of the crust were now able to start shifting around. You had this massive block of the crust sank down at this time. There was also an impact uh, in, uh, over in, uh, in Russia, massive uh, uh, asteroid impact associated with the breakup of the asteroid planet, which I mentioned earlier. You had this block of the crust sink down and churning waters of uh, the massive tsunamis were washing the vegetation in to this downwalk block. And this formed the massive coal measures across Europe and America that uh, uh, we have associated with the Permian extinction. Okay. Yeah. Immediately following the Permian extinction, you have the Mesozoic era, the era of, uh, of the reptiles, the volcanic. Associated with that extinction was a, the outpouring of over a million cubic miles of magma over in Russia, all the Siberian traps. That magma allowed a terrific amount of carbon dioxide to come into our atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide boosted temperatures. As a result of that, you would find that the amphibians would find it difficult to survive. Temperatures would be too high. The water bodies would dry up. You would find that the algae, the mosses, the ferns would be suffering from, uh, from these new conditions. And as a consequence, the reptiles would be favoured because they would be laying eggs which had shells which protected the embryos from, from damage, whereas amphibians weren't like that. And so this is why the reptiles were favoured. Can you do that a bit better than I can, Lana? Okay. I'll get tired <laughs> What was happening is after after the Babel incident, you had some giant river valleys forming. And this is something that Elaine Kennedy down at Geoscience Research Institute got together with Marianne and they said, this is what happened with the dinosaurs. She said they had to have these river valleys to live where it was hot and steamy because with their large body masses, they couldn't survive on the upper levels of land. Men are not going to live down in steamy river valleys. That's where the large reptiles live. And because it was geologically active down there, that's why we're able to find their fossils in this whole thing when they were buried or sandstorms went over them or something like that. That these guys couldn't make it. But it wasn't that men weren't alive. It wasn't that mammals weren't alive. It's just that they didn't want to live down in those geologically active areas. It's not until our time when people will live in San Francisco and wait for the earthquake, okay? And I love you guys here in Seattle, but you're standing right in the shadow of a massive volcano and right over these earthquake plates, and it had to be our stupid generation that was willing to do this. They were smarter after the flood. They moved to high ground. And that's why we don't see men fossilized with the dinosaurs. It was not that men didn't live then. It was that they weren't willing to live with the dinosaurs. And the dinosaurs were in the geologically active areas because those lower river valleys were where they could live. We do have in a lot of our ancient artifacts memories of dinosaurs. We see it in some of our old Roman and Greek pottery and in the friezes. We see evidence of the giant sea monsters. We see replicas of things that we've discovered in fossils in my lifetime. Um, we've got, I think it's downstairs, ICR years ago put out a really excellent thing, what happened to the dinosaurs and they track a lot of the dinosaur historical writings through the years, whether it's St. George and the dinosaur, which is probably mostly fictionalized, but nevertheless based on memories. But you can go back to Alexander the Great, whose armies were terribly surprised by some monstrous beast on their last invasion, which they were going to take over India and didn't quite make. Um, we've got the Thunderbird in America. What was that? Did they just make it up? Probably not. We've got the Pterosaurs in Egypt that were written about. So these things were all in the history of man, but we simply didn't get fossilized with them. Man's fossils are extremely rare. Hominid fossils are not that common. They are found, however, for instance, in the Old Divide Gorge in Africa. Gorge, down, get washed over, get, get flooded, get buried. You don't find man fossils on any of the craton areas, on any of the major areas. So this is what's happening. You find the fossil layers in areas that had 
the geologically active border areas or down through in here. And that's, go ahead. So that, as so Penny said, the geologically active areas in, in the Lisa zone in the time from uh, Babel to Pele was around the edge of the supercontinent. At this stage, the supercontinent had not broken up, at least not as we have it today. And so this is, uh, this area here was basically nowhere, uh, no fossils were found in, in these areas through through here, right? The Mesozoic, all Mesozoic fossils are found around here. Here's, here's Africa, here's South America. Right here, the Rocky Mountains have not risen yet, which is why we get a lot of dinosaur fossils in Montana in that area. This area was still a wash. That area was still low enough for the dinosaurs to be very happy in that area. Right. Where are we going next? Uh, next uh, I think uh, we have the next uh, slide done. Uh, um, okay. Um, we'll at, the, at the time of Pele, um, well, first of all, uh, we're told. Did you're upside down. Um, the test for you a different order. <laughs> we're told at the time of Babel in the, in the Bible that the Lord said, let us go down and see what they've done. Not like the Lord didn't know, right? But there's something about that going down. Could you hand me the Bible right there? Um, I'm assuming that Psalm 18 in here is going to be the same as Psalm 18, just about anywhere. I'm going to read you something. Okay, this is Psalm 18, when the Lord comes down. Listen to what happens. I don't know if this is remembering Babel or just in general what happens, but it's not a pleasant visit. And remember, the Lord came down at the Tower of Babel incident and uh, visited the... Uh, and the earth shook and quaked and the mountains of, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils and fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens, or bowed the heavens also, and came down with thick darkness under his feet, and he flew upon a cherub, and he rode upon a cherub and flew, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of water, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones, and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of the water appeared, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. That is a massive tsunami, folks. <coughs> At thy rebuke, O Lord, of the blasted breath in thy nostrils. So when it says in Genesis that the Lord came down to go visit Babel, you can figure that was a pretty catastrophic event. And that's... Um, that we associate in the in the geologic record with the Permian extinction. Go on from there to from the Permian back to the time of Pele. We still have this heating going on under the crust. And as Barry had mentioned, this heating of rocks is going to expand them in volume as you heat rocks and they become liquefied by 10 percent. Correct? This is going on under the crust, and the pressure's building, and the pressure's building. In the meantime, out in the asteroid area, the moon has finally given way. The moon has finally exploded a few years, a few orbital years before this. As we pass through that, we get some massive asteroid hits. We have record of them all the way across Europe and North America. We can still see where these massive craters you don't have that. Okay. Where the massive craters are, one down in the Caribbean, we've got um, the one in Arizona. Pretty, pretty massive hits. I have a question, and, and this is just me thinking, but if you take a look at Iceland, it is right smack on top of the Atlantic Rift. It comes, it's just right there. My question is, was this a major hit? Was the island the result of volcanic activity that resulted from a hit right there that started that crack? in the Atlantic Ocean, and it split apart. Why would it split apart? We've got molten rock that has now increased in volume 10%. And that, okay, go ahead with the math there. Okay, just on that, just on that math, uh, the 10% increase in volume from the time the rock uh, is uh, very hot to the time that it becomes molten, a 10% increase in volume is an 18% increase in the circumference 
of a sphere. Okay? 18% of 24,000 miles for the Earth is 4,700 miles, which is the width of the Atlantic Ocean. So the excess pressure from the rock, which had become molten in our interior, eventually split, allowed the Earth to split open once this uh, impact occurred. The Earth split open massively. You had the rift in the, uh, in the Atlantic formed, and you had this supercontinent separated and you have Babel uh, and you have uh, Peleg uh, born around about the same time. He was named Peleg which means division and it has to do with waters. We get other words like Pelagos from it, like Pelican. Um, there's Mount Pele in the Caribbean. There's the volcanic goddess Pele in Hawaii. This word is still remembered all the way around the world associated with destruction, volcano and water. Okay, and then there was mountain As the Earth split, did you remember what the we don't have globes here? What the globe looks like? As the Atlantic Ocean splits like this, you have the Pacific Rim forming all the way around the other side, which is now called the Ring of Fire, where the Earth had buckled up with its crust. You have some sinking, some buckling up, where this weak spot in the Earth all the way around. You have the mountains that start even north of here and go all the way down the Pacific coast, um, both the Rockies and the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, go down into South America, continue mountainous chain down through Chile and all the way down. This is the most recent mountains building up. The Himalayas were built up in this time. The Indonesian mountains and volcanoes were built up in this time. The Mariana Trench sunk at this time. All of this is a result of the Pele continental splitting. The word used in Genesis 10.25 is not a word that means population, it's a word that means land mass. It's the same word used in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word earth is the same word there as in Genesis 10.25. It means a geologic mass. It means something which is earth. That was split at the time of Pele. It probably took 100 or 200 years for this whole thing because that's a pretty massive split. In the meantime, if you go into the book of Job, Job lived during this time. And during this time and right after, you find references to what happened in the book of Job. He talks about the sloshing of the seas. They had to keep a watch on the sea. Why? Because when a tsunami comes first, it goes out. And then it comes back in. Get out of the way. He talks about... Do, do Mount, we have that list of things? being overturned by the root. Yeah, I think I've got that uh, in this week. Uh, let me, uh, I know it's skipping to the end, but it is. Yeah, that's late. fine. It is. Yeah. Evidence from Job. Here we go. Um, Job 9, 5 to 7 considered, considered first fits the impact of the Peleg scenario event. Well, remember the earth shaking event occurred during the lifetime of Job's uncle or father. Um, he lived in the land of Uz. Uz turns out to be his great uncle. If you take a look in, the, in Genesis, is it a, it's 11, right? I think it's Genesis 11. Uh, yes. Um, here's some of the stuff from Job. God removes the mountains and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth out of its place and its core trembles. He commands the sun and it does not rise. He blots out the stars. This quotation refers to asteroid impacts, the continents split open, the ocean courses through these breaks, shakes the earth out of its place, the sun seems to fail to rise because you've got an axis tilt at this time, which is a whole other section of the science we couldn't go into. Um, however, this axis tilt is what also resulted in the magnetic stripes we find in the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, stars were blotted out due to debris clouds. Peleg and his brother Yachtan and their relatives were eyewitnesses to these events. We find references to volcanism, rifting, and magma in Job, Job 28.9 and 14.18. The crust tears apart in the Jordan Rift. During the Ice Age, many, there were many catastrophic events. It explains passages like this. The mountains fall and crumble away and rock is removed from its place. Underneath it is turned to fire whose stones are the source of sapphires and contain gold dust. Job and his friends observed molten rock flowing from volcanic vents and knew the gems crystallized out of this. There's a reference to volcanic firestorms in Job 27. The storm steals him away in the night. A burning fiery wind carries him away and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls against him and does not spare. 
In Job 1, we find the catastrophes which affected Job's first family and, his, and all of his property. One of the servants comes and tells him, Fire has fallen from heaven and burned up the sheep and servants and consumed them. And suddenly a great wind from the wilderness struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young men. This refers to the volcanic fire and tornadic winds that come from volcanoes. As they fell, seemed to fall from the skies and destroyed the flocks, houses, and people. This was no ordinary fire or wind. It was much too large an event for that. The Ice Age is referred to in Job. In Job 38, 29 to 30, God challenges him from whose womb comes the ice. The ocean waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. This happened in the Middle East. Job saw it. It happened in the Jordan Rift, in the Red Sea, up through Galilee to the Mediterranean. This arm of the ocean has since been cut off, but it, will, it froze over at that time in the winter of the Ice Age. Cavemen are listed in Job. If you look carefully, all of the, the old Neanderthals or whatever. Um, you have it here. There's just one here. There are two groups. One is in Job 30. 3 to 7. The other is in Job 24, 7 to 8. These are people who were basically kicked out of society for whatever reason, some whose fathers were thieves and some who were just poor and people tend to be snobby about poor people. But what we do see is they were gaunt with want and famine and plucked mallow by the bushes and broom tree roots for their food. They lived in the clefts of the valleys. Their houses were the caves and the rocks and they lived under the wild bushes. They spent the night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They're wet with the showers of the mountains and huddle around the rock for want of shelter. Job was an eyewitness to the events that happened after Peleg and during the Ice Age that struck even down to the Middle East at that time. We have geologic records of this. It fits with the Bible. Um, we're running very late, I believe. But that, are there things that we wanted to add? That is our final slide that we have here on this have the complete coordination creation week creation started 5810 BC you had the uh, flood in 3554 BC snowball earth then you had the global catastrophe uh, in 3182 BC Palais continental division in 3023 BC and then the ice age starting around about 2900 BC and ending around about 2345 BC that basically gives you the, uh, the trend that we have and what we have here is these corresponding atomic dates for the Noah's flood of 730, 720 million atomic years ago, the uh, Babel catastrophe corresponding to the Permian extinction 251 million atomic years ago, the uh, Cretaceous tertiary extinction when the Pele continental division began. 65.5 million atomic years ago, but it was really only 3023 BC and so on. So you can get the complete coordination of all of your biblical events, your geological events, your astronomical events, all in this one time frame because of the increase in the zero point energy that came from the original stretching of the universe. Yes. Is that on your website or something? Or that one is on our website, yes. I'll be getting up more as much as I can. I think if there's anything we wanted to leave everybody with, it's don't be afraid of the data. Follow it. Look for the truth. Don't be afraid of it. God did not lie in his creation. Okay. Yes. When are you writing your book? We've got two in progress, and it's up to me now to finish editing. It's my fault. Um, however, if you know of a publisher who's willing to take it on, let us know, because nobody's willing to publish his work. He doesn't agree with the creationist organizations, they won't touch it. He doesn't agree with the evolutionists, so the major publishers won't touch it. Any of you know of any publisher that's willing to deal with it? Hey, we'd be happy.